Hi, Peter. How are you? Hi, Peter. How are you? Good. Yeah. Good. Have a nice day. It's a very busy day. Yeah, it's okay. Good. Lots, lots of lots of rain. Very strange, isn't it, for for the end of end of spring, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's and it's very windy as well. Can I see your 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 dog in the background? Dog's right here. Yeah. What's um? Is her name? Dizzy. Izzy. Dizzy. Okay. She's she's more than welcome to join us. It's, uh... <laughs> she won't leave, so I think you've got no choice. Oh, well, yeah, the, the the more the merrier. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hi Sophie. Hi there. Here I am. You okay? Yes, thanks. I shall unblur my background um, if I can see how to do that. Wow, that's very high tech. <laughs> Hi, Peter. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to blur my background. So. Oh, I'm admiring your pictures. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's one. There's one here that is the real. Real deal. Oh my goodness. That's me with Sue. Yes. That's a portrait. Oh wow. Pretty special. I'll just see what David the prompts behind me. If I go like that, you can see them. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Yeah. So, yeah, we can uh, definitely see them. The, the, those original, those or? They are. Um, that's this is Swallows. This is Swallow's original flag, and I didn't realise until recently that you can actually see some of the stitches that I stitched in Vision in oh. the scene with rather modern white thread. And she's getting a little bit elderly. There's a little hole there, a bit worried about that. But this is was made by um, the property master on location, Bob Hedges. And then these were made on location, I think, as mock-ups to try out the size, but they didn't use them. The swallow is she's flying towards the shaft, which is correct, but she looks a bit um squidged, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> um so Hello, they were trying them out. So they these were called rehearsal flags, and we were given them after the filming ended as children. Um Someone, a, a wonderful troll called Buggerlugs, has just accused me of nicking the props, but <laughs> we were given them and they, because they weren't hired or anything, they were made specially. Oh, yes, yes. Hello, David. How are you? I'm fine, Philip. How are you? Hello, Sophie. Hello. <laughs> I'm Peter. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. Everyone looking very good. I've got a new computer. I was a little bit lost just now, but I've found everything now. <laughs> I've got I'd, be very, I'd be very lost with a new computer. Oh, God, don't. It's, it's been a bit tricky, but never mind. <laughs> so uh, we'll just take a few moments because I think there's still a few audience members to, to log on. Um, so if people do want to watch the film while we're having our chat, just in the in the background, if you happen to have your copy of it to to hand, it might sort of uh, um, stow up some questions you might have for for the guests. So uh, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, if people do want to do that option, I'll do a little countdown from five and press play, so we're kind of in sync. Um, uh, if we put, if you pause on the EMI logo at the beginning, that's probably a good uh, reference point. Um, otherwise, just sit back and enjoy the uh, the conversation. Getting my copy uh, in front of me. Okay, so I do a countdown from five uh, to zero, and then we'll press play and, and begin. So five, four, three, two, one, and play. Uh, so the first question I had for everybody, um, how did the film come into your your lives to, to begin with? Um, Sophie, do you want to start us off? 
<laughs> but for me, it was absolutely extraordinary. My father was sent a letter by Neville Thompson, Neville C. Thompson, and he was away in South Africa, so my mother nearly didn't open it. But she was intrigued by the letter, with the silver writing on the envelope, which said Theatre Projects. So she opened it, and she never opened one of my father's letters ever before in her life. And it was a letter inviting me for an interview with the director, Claude Watham. And we literally, Dad, we picked up Dad from Heathrow and drove into London, and I had the interview. And if she hadn't opened the letter until my father returned from South Africa, I would have missed the chance to audition for the part of Titty. So it came out of the blue, I was an ordinary school girl, and suddenly, poof! And what's quite funny was that when I wrote about it, um, uh, uh, somebody reviewed the first three chapters of my book on the making of Swallows and Amazons, which is uh, one of these here, here we go, this one. <laughs> and the reviewer said, well, it's quite a good idea for a novel, but it's a bit far-fetched. And the extraordinary thing was, it's absolutely true. <laughs> I They did write to me because I'd been in the first BBC play of Side With Rosie, which Claude Wathamer directed. And I later sort of realised that Claude liked to work with people, actors who he knew already when he was working on a movie, because it's quite risky. Um, there's so much money involved. So he wanted to be sure of uh, who is going to cast and that we weren't going to misbehave or um, have hysterics or something. So he did, he had worked with me before, um, but really I just had one interview and then I was invited on what we call a sailing audition. We were all whizzed off to Burnham on Crouch. Were they, Richard Pilbrow, the producer had found the dinghy to play swallow and he auditioned i think there were about 20 of us children going for the six parts maybe 22 with his two children fred and abigail and i know there were five girls auditioning to play titty and i didn't think i was in with a chance because apart from anything i was too old i was already 12 and i was too tall i was about five foot two um taller than the boys who were auditioning to play john so I thought I was far too gangly and wouldn't have been probably right for the other characters. Um, but he did choose me. Um, so that was amazing. The other girls auditioning were far more pretty and neat and together and better organised than me. <laughs> uh, and, and David? No, well, um, I had been in the film If as as you remember, Philip, because we've done a um, one of these about if, and uh, I suppose a couple of years later, um, Neville C. Thompson, who Sophie has just mentioned, uh, who had been an associate producer on If, and had worked almost like a production manager. I'd seen quite a lot of him um, during the making of that film. Uh, and he asked if we could meet. And we went to a, a, a pub in Drury Lane, I remember. And uh, he said, um, uh, he said, you've been writing children's plays, haven't you? And you've had a couple in London. And I said, yes. So he said, um, uh, have you ever read Swallows and Amazons? And uh, <clears throat> I was honest and I said, no. Uh, <laughs> I said, my cousin. Uh, has all the Swallows and Amazons books, but he's a year older than me. And uh, when I used to go around and see him when I was, I don't know, 10, um, uh, I always thought that the books would be too old for me because he was a year older. So I never read them. Uh, so he said, well, we're making a film and uh, would you have a read of it and just see whether you might be interested in doing the screenplay? Well, I'd never done a screenplay before. So this was very nice. Um, Possibility. Uh, I read the book, um, thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, although I have to admit I had never been sailing. I had no interest in going sailing at all. Uh, I don't think I'd ever been to the Lake District, <laughs> but um, I certainly was very taken with the story. Uh, I think what I really liked about it is something that I've 
I've done. I mean, we're now talking 50 years on, uh, but I've written lots more plays since then. And the ones that I'm really interested in adapting or even doing myself are those that look at things from the point of view of the child. Uh, you see things through a child's eyes. And uh, and Ransom, like a lot of uh, very good children's authors, manages to get rid of the parents very early on, uh, at least the, the father and the, and the mother, really, um, uh, uh, amazingly, uh, gives the children permission to go off to the island on their own. Um, so we lose the parents and we're living the story through their eyes. Anyway, um, I said, yes, I'm interested to have a go. Uh, and they said, right, off you go. And uh, and that was it. And I uh, I went to Menorca um, uh, on holiday and it wasn't really a holiday because I spent the time uh, reading the book and rereading it and rereading it and then gutting it and getting it into some sort of shape for a film because a screenplay, it's a very different shape, a structure from that of a book. Um, and, uh, uh, and I presented that and... Uh, Various other things happened, which we might go into later, which involved uh, meeting Arthur Ransom's widow and getting uh, approval to go ahead. I wrote the script and uh, uh, and the film was made. So I was incredibly lucky because some people write, I don't know, 15 screenplays and then maybe if they're lucky, get one off the ground. But my very first one did get off the ground. And I think that was really thanks to Arthur Ransom. It was thanks to... Uh, everybody who worked on the film and uh, and Claude, who was a very sympathetic director towards the whole idea, um, which uh, always impressed me. And certainly Richard Pearlbrow, who again, Sophie mentioned, uh, who uh, was a, a, a devotee of, of the books um, and really wanted to do to do something which was faithful to the book and not muck around with it. Uh, which was certainly my intention too. And and, and Peter, how did you uh, get on onto the film? <laughs> That's a, I think mine's another first as well because I um, believe it again was to do with Neville um, because I I've never achieved a film. This was my first film that I the first film that I made was for chief makeup artist, and it's a combination of I must have got a phone call because that's how you got work for uh, in, in my side of the business. And um, I don't remember going for an interview or anything, but maybe I did. And they said, but Neville, I know, was always very helpful and very, you know, very good with me. And I think it was a combination of him and also the production manager. And they said, well, we're doing this film in the Lake District. Uh, we'd like you to do it with Ronnie Cogan, who was a hairdresser, who I had worked with before. And uh, the rest is, uh, you know, this is my, was my first job as a chief makeup artist. And so um, it was not a small film. It was a, it was a full feature film, but it had a, a, a smaller, a smallish cast. And obviously, you know, we did it by us, the two of us did the film. So that's how I got to do it. And um, it was a great experience. And we'll talk about that later. And obviously, it, you know, I, I was lucky because, you know, from then on, I, I I pretty much didn't do any other. Well, I did do some films as a second, but a lot of the films subsequent as well as an Amazon, I was the chief makeup artist. So, yeah. So, again, it was a first for me. And and, and Sophie and Peter, were you both familiar with, with the book um, prior, prior to your involvement in the film? Well, I was um, because my father had loved them and grown up with them. And he'd been, a, he was born in 1929. So he was of the generation when he was 10 or eight, he'd get one for Christmas. And every Christmas he got another, probably a first edition. And he grew up sailing and, <coughs> excuse me, and really wanted me to read them. So I read Swallows and Amazons and I think, six of the other books in the series of 12 and obviously I read it I read the book again just before we went filming and so uh, David's script which was very similar to the book the dialogue was very similar to the book 
we we didn't even see the script. I have got one downstairs. I meant to bring it up to go and get it. Um, but we weren't allowed to see the script. Claude didn't want us to be parity um, or stagey. But we could remember the dialogue from the book. But what was quite interesting was that when you're actually sailing, there's a whole chunk of dialogue in the book that you wouldn't have possibly have time to say when you were busy heading rather fast towards the steamer. There isn't time for it. So we, we just we just said what you would say in a situation like that. And I think the classic line that I don't know if it's in your script or not, David, but <laughs> when the I've been sleeping all night in the Amazon. Ah, at anchor by Cormorant Island. And when my brothers and sisters arrive and sailing towards me, they think that the Amazon is adrift. But I pop up and, and all I could think of saying was, I've got her, I've got her. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the reaction that you have at the time. And in a way, it's that natural line that just came out of me. I was stiff and wet because someone hadn't bailed her no one had bailed her out and the sail was all wet but it was like that line in the railway children where Bobby says my daddy my daddy <laughs> with Amazon it was I've got her I've got her <laughs> um but some of Ransom's lines are very difficult to deliver here we are intrepid explorers um and some of David's lines I thought were just um extraordinary like x marks the spot where they ate six missionaries um, which are very amusing and people love these one-liners from the film and we I, I i put a post on facebook recently asking what people's favorite one-liners were and one girl said did he go that way <laughs> that's the family's best one-liner which hadn't occurred to me um, but they find that most amusing and I suppose scream at it, it, each other all the time. But people love the cormorants. They've got India rubber nets and they love the pirate and they play games. When You know when you're on a long car journey, so if they see a man with a beard um, and a pipe, they can say, I, I expect he's a retired pirate working on his devilish crimes. <laughs> Um, and I think now movies are quite famous for one-liners, but certainly I think Swallows and Amazons caps them all. Uh, they're pirates. I haven't said that properly. They're pirates. No, I'm not doing it. They're, pi they're pirates. <laughs> I can't say it now. <laughs> but they gave me some very good lines. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Peter, were, were you familiar well, with my that? experience was was David's script? I mean, definitely because I hadn't read the book. I loved the script, and obviously, I loved I loved the film. And I I know it, it, we haven't talked about that, but I was hoping, as indeed was the producer, you know, and Neville and Richard, that there would be many of these you know books, Arthur Ransom books, printed, not printed, uh, filmed. And you know that was a great shame that it, it didn't happen because you know, I thought it was a wonderful film anyway to work on. But it also it could have continued, you know, with other with other um, options, you know, on other on these other books, but not all of them. But you know, certainly you know there are plenty plenty to choose from. Hmm. So uh, but no, I mean I, I love the script, and that's what I remember. And well, I was able to, and I was able to read the script. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I know that um, Richard Pilbrow was planning to make Great Northern because he had a house on coal in the Outer Hebrides and it was really on his heart to do that. And it was very sad that we didn't go ahead. I gather Mrs. Ransom wasn't too keen. But actually, in 1984, I worked, actually, it was 1983 we filmed it. I worked on the BBC adaptations of Coop Club and the Big Six with Julian uh -huh. Bennett as the baddie. and. Henry Dimbleby as the hero. And I worked on that for nine months. So I started off, I was a general trainee at the BBC and I was given the unusual job of casting the children um, because the BBC didn't use casting directors at the time. And the producer knew that it would take a long time to find 
children with Norfolk accents who could sail and handle boats and there were identical twins playing port and starboard and quite large parts of uh, Dick and Dorothea and Tom Dudgeon. And we cast, I didn't cast the adults, but Tom, um, Colin Baker, who later became Doctor Who, played Doctor Dudgeon. And that was extraordinary because he was cast and then I found Henry to play his son, Tom Dudgeon, but quite by chance. Um, and actually Colin Baker at the time looked just like David Dimbleby, <laughs> Henry's father. Um, and we had a great fun doing that. The Swallows and Amazons weren't involved, the characters, but Joe Waters, the producer, called the series Swallows and Amazons Forever, which is how it's sold as a DVD today. Right. Because he was planning to do more books in the series. And actually, I started working on what we were hoping would be Swallowdale and Pigeon Post. So not sailing films, but on the high tops and the moors in the Lake District. And... Joe and his production associate went up to Cumbria to to do the recce and she just shook her head. She said it's going to be far too expensive to make. Very expensive filming in the Lake District. It's a long way from London. And it didn't come off. Uh, it was sad. It was sort of cancelled, I think, at top level in favour of Casualty, which has been quite a successful <laughs> series. But we were going to make um, more of the book adaptation and I still think they should make we didn't mean to go to see it's fabulous but very emotive well of course it's only uh it's only fair to say that uh I did uh I did a six part uh adaptation of Pigeon Post which was never used not for Joe I don't think and I can't yeah. remember how it came about um and uh, so that's in a drawer somewhere <laughs> I did a full screenplay of Great Northern, the one you mentioned in Scotland. And uh, at the time, uh, Richard and uh, uh, others were thinking about Peter Sellers playing Gemmeling, the bird nest egg collector or whatever. Um, that never got made. And I did a, a treatment for We Didn't Mean to Go to Sea, again, a six part serial, because in fact, I thought that was that was eminently filmable. That seemed to me to be a, a perfect subject for film. Um, and that never got made. Uh, and I never got paid for any of them. <laughs> but we did We did try. The idea was there. Uh, the Great Northern, the story behind that, as far as I know, is that, as you said, Sophie, Mrs. Ransom uh, uh, said no. Um, and in fact, I got a letter from Mrs. Ransom, which was uh, a, a very angry letter saying that she'd seen in the press that we were intending to do a follow up to Swallows and Amazons and it would be Great Northern. And she said, uh, you will certainly not do this um, and uh, I will make sure that it is not done. And uh, and indeed, we, we, we didn't. Uh, and my theory I was always that this was the only one written about uh, Scotland, set in Scotland. And uh, when uh, Ransom and his wife were living in the Lake District, uh, he used to go off on holiday to Scotland with uh, Quilla Cooch, I think, who was the uh, poetry critic. And, uh, and they used to fish and he would stay up there for two weeks, three weeks. And uh, she was left all on her own. Uh, and the only knowledge she would have that he was alive uh, would be the clip clop of a horse and cart coming down the lane uh, from the railway station, uh, delivering a, a salmon, which he had caught and had uh, <laughs> sent to her. Uh, and whether or not she resented Scotland because of this, I just don't know. But um, no, she was adamant that uh, Great Northern was not to be filmed. Did, did you know if, if she liked the Swallows and Amazons, whether she was happy with the with the film? Uh, she certainly never said that she wasn't. Um, and uh, the uh, what uh, we'd better say now that she uh, was an extraordinary woman. She was a Russian lady who had been Trotsky's secretary. And uh, Ransom was working for the Manchester Guardian in Moscow. Uh, when the Russian Revolution was bubbling away. 
and uh, used to go and visit Trotsky and she was in the front office as it were and would welcome him in. They fell in love and eventually eloped uh, in a boat, uh, very swallows and Amazish, and uh, came to live here, which they, they, they did. Uh, and when I was sent to see her, which uh, Richard and Neville said um, that it was important that we had her blessing. I think they probably got the rights, but she still probably just had the ability to say no if she was unhappy about the idea. So I was dispatched to um, a rather posh uh, retirement village in Banbury, and uh, and she she was she welcomed me in, but she was quite austere, shall we say? Um, and um, uh, we talked a bit, and she was saying that the children should wear Airtex shirts, and uh, and <laughs> there was this strange thing where she seemed to want all the children to be blonde and blue eyed. Uh, I think that was something that was ignored. Uh, but um, <laughs> the odd strange thing did happen. Uh, there was a uh, a half sort of landing and on it there was a chest. And, uh, and at one point she pointed to this chest and she said, uh, in that chest is my husband's autobiography. Uh, it will not be published until I am dead. <laughs> now, I didn't understand, obviously, what was in it that um, so either offended her or she didn't want it revealed until after her death. Um, when I read it, when it did come out after she had died, um, there was stuff about Ransom's first wife. Um, and maybe, you know, she didn't want that. Uh, but um, uh, no, there were these strange um, uh, messages coming out. But when I finished the screenplay, uh, it was sent to her. And Richard and Neville had this brilliant idea that she should be invited up to the Lake District and that we would all meet up there and uh, we could talk about it. And not only that, I mean, they obviously arranged for her because she, she wasn't very mobile, really. Uh, but they must have um, arranged for her to be either driven. I know they treated her very well, and uh, and suddenly suggested that we should all go to uh, Peel Island or Wildcat Island to um, see uh, where it all had happened, and uh, and suddenly this immobile elderly lady was leaping like a gazelle into uh, the the boat. Uh, and out onto the island and was taking us around very animatedly, pointing to things and saying, oh, there is um, uh, the big tree uh, and uh, there is uh, the, the landing place and all this. Um, and this this obviously was, was, was good because nostalgia was creeping in. So we went back to the hotel and uh, I was almost locked into a room with her uh, to talk about the screenplay. And um, I had no idea what she was going to come up with, but she started off by saying uh, this line, and she pointed to a line, she said, this line you have given to Susan, Susan would never say that line. And uh, I, I hope not too smugly, but I had a copy of the book and I was able to flip my way through and find the right page and show her and say, well, actually, your husband did give that line to Susan. And she gave me a sort of old fashioned look and almost a little smile. And she said, I think it will be all right. And that was it, okay. end of meeting. Uh, so um, I got away with that one. And, uh, <laughs> but I never actually spoke to her directly after the film came out, but certainly there was no sign that uh, she wasn't uh, she wasn't happy with it. And I can see no reason why she wouldn't have been really because um, it was faithful. Uh, Sophie is absolutely right. There's quite a lot of uh, lines uh, in the film that are not mine. And there are quite a lot of my lines that are not in the film. Uh, but I, I think that's a positive in many ways because Claude had this thing of wanting the children to be natural. He didn't want them to just be saying lines. And uh, he wanted them to experience it uh, and to uh, go through 
all the activities, whether it be putting up a tent, maybe it be lighting a fire, maybe filling a kettle, whatever it might be. And uh, and, and I think that, that was the right approach so that I think, and Sophie can tell us more, but I mean, I do think that it must have become a sort of adventure for them uh, in, in real terms. It wasn't just a question of making a film. I think they were learning and enjoying and experiencing uh, often in rather terrible weather, I think. <laughs> um, I asked Richard what Mrs Ransom thought of the film and he did show it to her. And he said, all she had to say was, the kettle in Mrs Jackson's farmhouse well, Mrs. Jackson's kettle was the wrong period. <laughs> so he thought, oh, well, if that's all she could find that was wrong with it, then it was probably all right. <laughs> so um, she didn't have anything else she could find uh, to criticise, apart from the fact the kettle was the wrong period. So uh, she was happy, but... She, I don't think she <laughs> expressed glee exactly. I can't remember meeting her, but apparently she did come up onto lo oh, on location. I think it's when we were very first filming and the rain was pouring down. We would have been at Background Farm doing the Holly Howe scenes when Virginia McKenna was there. And we weren't introduced to Mrs. Ransom. I think she took a look at us and decided we were okay. She was very reticent, um, in fact, nearly stopped the filming because she didn't like the photograph she was sent of Sten Grandin, who played Roger, because he had dark hair, black hair. She didn't think any of the children should have black hair. And I can only think it was all because they'd had a bit of a row with the Altoonian family, who the original Swallows had been uh, modelled on who all had dark hair and are portrayed with bobbed hair in the books. And she, there was a bit of friction between the families, according to um, Taki Altuni, and they were, Arthur Ransom and her father were great rivals. And so Mrs Ransom wanted us to look quite different, which is probably why she told David she wanted us, all the characters, to be blue-eyed and fair-haired, which they sort of are in the... 2016 version actually and in that version quite a lot of people criticized that casting but it happened I suppose along the lines of Mrs Ransom's wishes so there we go um but um I know what someone said I was far too pale but actually Titty was a real girl Titty Altunian who I was modeled on and I had my DNA done found out that actually I do share about um, seventy-five percent of my ancestry with Titty Altunian, but she was a quarter Armenian, which um, gave her the lovely thick dark hair and darker skin than my skin. Which poor Peter had to spend his time lathering with sun cream, so I didn't burn on vacation and completely spoil all the continuity. It wasn't a problem. It wasn't a problem. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't have enough sunshine for it to be a problem. Rain most of the time. <laughs> I, I was wondering, um, about Peter and Sophie, what Virginia Virginia McKenna was was like. What you remember of her? Well, she was wonderful with me. I mean, she, you know, she was obviously a very well known actress, and um, you know, and, I, and she and she looked she looked fabulous at the time. And I did a very, you know, very period makeup on her and she was very happy with it. And she was very kind. Um, in fact, everybody on the film was like that. So it was a joy, you know, it was a joy. It was a wonderful film to work on for, because as Sophie said, you know, there, we, I didn't do ex excessive makeup on the children, but everything happened to do with the weather and, you know, you have to, everything has to match. For the whole film and it's not shot in sequence so you know we have, we had to do corrective things on the children if if anything happened to them um you know if they got a scratch you know, that there wasn't in the script or anything you know any any action caused anything so you know there was always that sort of work to do but you know i my my motto is less is more 
And obviously children didn't need to be fully made up in that period in with the film stock that we had and, and with the lighting. But, you know, there was always work to do on all of them. You know, if, if, they, if, if we got the sun, I don't remember it raining every day, but it did rain a lot. But then it's so green up there that that's why it's so green because, you know, it was, it was a, you know, it's a fabulous location for the for the scenery. So um, no, it was it was you know it was fine. Um, Virginia was really key at a number of levels. I mean, it was her name that was selling the film? I think her casting was exactly right. She was wonderful in that she made it fun for us and she got us to concentrate and she was a great example. And our first scenes were with her. The very first scene shot was that first scene in the railway carriage, which was a tricky scene because there wasn't much space and it got very hot, but it was great fun. And she set us all off in the right direction. At the same time, she was incredibly gracious to the press who came on location from that very first day. I don't think, Peter, they they discourage or don't have press on location on movies now. And there are sort of bans on posting anything at all on social media or taking photographs because it's so distracting. But she simply got out of that railway carriage and was talking to the journalist from the Times on day one. So there was a lot of pressure on her and at back home she had her own four children and she'd come all the way up from talking in Surrey. Uh, I think that the film might have been scheduled for the summer term because it was easier for her to get away and she wanted to spend the summer holidays with her own children. Uh, so <laughs> that's probably why we shot it in the summer term but in fact the Lake District is much easier to get about while people are still at school. It gets very busy in July and August, so it might have been warmer and sunnier then. But we started filming on the 14th of May, I think, or we got up on the 14th of May when it was really quite chilly and spring-like. And we had to do those interior scenes in Background Farm because it was pouring with rain outside. And then Virginia had to come back to do the scenes with me on Peel Island because we didn't we didn't finish all her scenes in the first 10 days when she was scheduled to be there. So it was for her quite a minor film, a minor role, but in fact, it's been an enduring film and it's been important to a lot of people as they've grown up. And it's a film that people keep watching and remember. And someone told me recently that it's been screened on British television more than any other film. And one reason is that there's no restrictions on it. It's got a use certificate. Mm -hmm. So it can be screened at any time of day and is a sort of first thing on Sunday morning, um, a children film. But it's also one of the very few films you can screen outside on a big screen, say at a festival. So it's used quite a lot at screened at nautical festivals and summer festivals when people their children have been running around all day and they want to calm them down before they can put them to bed. So it has been a babysitting film, but for that reason, because it's a classic, I think parents, as Helen, Helen Fielding says, you, you want your children to watch a classic, a, a, a good film, not rubbish. And families tell me they've seen it 30, 40, 50 times, and they can recite all your lines. <laughs> they can just recite all the dialogue, David. So none of that time you put into it uh, was wasted. And the other thing is that people, I think because Virginia McKenna has got that lovely blonde hair and Ronnie Cogan just put it up as, as a mother would have put up her hair. She didn't wear a wig. And the fact that she wasn't wearing a wig and wore period clothes and very simple clothes really gave the film a longevity because uh, if you can remember in the 70s and 80s, David, when you were probably acting in a lot of films, the wigs weren't great and you could see the, um, the tool at the front of them. And 
and a lot of films, I mean, like the Railway Children, Diana Sheridan's makeup is very, has a very 70s accent on it. And it kind of dated the film, whereas Swallows and Amazons, we were wearing such simple costumes that apart from one acrylic jumper that Captain John wears, you really can't, it didn't date the film. So it's kept its freshness and People have seen the remastered copy that Studio Canal have brought out and that's streaming on Amazon now. And they say to me, oh, is that the film made recently? And no, it's made 50 years ago. Actually, 51. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of its release this year. So we actually right. filmed it in the summer of 1973. Um, I have a question for, for David from Susan. Um, did you find it easy to use Ransom's dialogue and to work out what to keep and what would be your invention? Yes, I think so. Um, the the uh, What I often do when I'm writing a, a play or indeed a screenplay, not that I've written that many screenplays, um, is to get to know the book so well uh, and then I write it in shorthand, the, the, what happens. And an interesting thing develops whereby some things get left out uh, and some things come into my, my, my mind maybe in a different order. Uh, and, um, and that's helpful. It doesn't mean to say that I'm going to write it like that, but it means that maybe um, in order to tell the story uh, filmically, it may be uh, that one needs to uh, lose certain things and maybe even to add certain things. Um, but no, the, the dialogue in the book is, um, it, it, whether one calls it very period dialogue, I don't know, uh, it, but it's not uh, phrases and words that we would necessarily all say today um you know um but i i rather loved that and i thought that 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 was actually important to keep so um you see what sophie was saying then is 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 very is very true really because it is a period film but what is not apparent is the date that we were shooting it at do you see what I mean? I mean, it 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 feels as though it is um, earlier, uh, and the makeup does not say, "Oh, this is 1974, 75. Um, and there's a certain simplicity, and I think what Peter said is very important: the fact that it wasn't overdone. Um, they weren't caked with um, uh, makeup at all. Uh, so uh, I did wonder whether the cast because they were uh, on the whole they were not actors i mean sophie had acted perhaps more uh than the others although azana hamilton who played susan was very much part of the anna share um a children's theater and was uh you know had done things but i wondered whether they would find some of the expressions a little bit archaic um and i think some of those may have been lost in the making. Claude may not have used those because um, uh, he wanted them to be a bit more natural. Uh, but uh, things like um, one might almost say by gum, something which John says at one point. Lines like that, I thought, yes, well, let's, let's put them in because they, they are the character of the, of the story and of the writing. And that's what people to a certain extent will expect um and a lot of uncle jim's uh lines as as well uh, captain flint's lines um which, which are sort of you know pretty gung-ho and hearty and all the rest of it but i think it, that's important um uh, yes I, I i didn't i didn't really think about that too much uh except to try and be faithful to um to ransom and uh, Sophie, I was wondering about the um, your fellow cast members, uh, the Swallows um, actors. So, uh, of course, Simon West, Susan Hamilton, Stephen Grendon. Do you remember much about about them? And um... 
Did you see them post over the years? Yes, I've seen them uh, over the years, and Susanna and I are quite close. Um, Sten had actually done, I know his full name is Stephen, but he was always called Sten by his mother. Um, he'd done the most acting because he played Laurie Lee in the first side with Rosie. So Claude had worked more days with him. I'd had a, quite a small part. Um, I just had to play the piano, which was difficult, but I'd only worked on side with Rosie for about three days. And Susanna had done um, a little bit of, of television, actually with Virginia McKenna. Um, and Simon had done nothing at all, in fact. <laughs> and he was absolutely brilliant. Uh, he's very bright and caught on to everything straight away. And Claude admitted that, Simon virtually directed the sailing sequences because he's such a good sailor. I think that Richard Pearlbrow's decision to cast children, certainly as the Amazons and John, he decided that they absolutely had to be brilliant sailors. They were going to cast them children at sailing clubs, uh, which is actually what I did when I cast the children for Coot Club and the Big Six. And that I think a lot of the success of the film is owed to that fact and the fact that Simon was and is a brilliant sailor. And you can tell just when he's sitting in the boat. It's like a brilliant rider. You can just tell when they're leading a horse or sitting on it. Uh, and the fact that the Amazons were fluent sailors, really good, because in those blustery Lakeland um, conditions, you do need someone who has just done a lot of time at the helm. Um, I've been taught to sail or crew rather by my father. And I was happy in a boat, but Susanna and I, um, everyone forgot that actually I captured the Amazon. So I spent a lot of time in the Amazon. We had to row. I rode the Amazon. Well, I rode Swallow to the back from the um, visit to the charcoal burners, but I had to row Amazon out of Secret Harbour, which is quite difficult. <laughs> and then rode Amazon um, across Derwent Water and then had to sail her back with Susanna. Uh, and that's when we veered away from the book. Titty's meant to sail back with John and she, he lets her take the helm. And I wish we'd done that. But in reality, when we were filming, the conditions were so tricky and the camera crew were on a pontoon. And he needed Simon to be sailing Swallow so that he could get the two shots of, actually a three shot, so he could get Susanna and I in the foreground, Swallow in the right position, we were talking to them, and then the Amazons on Peel Island in the background. That's very difficult to achieve. In blustery weather, when we're all rather cold, out on constant water, when you've got safety boats blocking off modern, um, um, shipping, I'm about to say, <laughs> modern sailing boats and um, it, very difficult. So he needed he needed Simon's skills. And you can see Simon's just completely at one with his vessel. Um, I battled at the helm because they're difficult to turn those little boats and I didn't want to ruin Amazon's pentals and Susanna took the helm and we just went whizzing off. Amazon's quite a fast boat to sail. And those are the photographs that ended up on the cover of one of the books and is actually still being used in the press today. It was um, published in the Westland Gazette this week because on the 29th and 30th of June, we are gathering with the boats, Swallow and Amazon and David and Peter at Windermere Jetty Museum on Windermere. Um, it, it, the gates open at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, the 29th of June. And we hope that everyone will be able to come. It's the event's being hosted by the Arthur Ransom Society. Um, so although I think you need to pay the Windermere Jetty or Lakeland Arts for parking and to see around the museum as a whole, the extra activities that we're laying on are free. And I can't wait because we've also got the opportunity to go out in some of the steamboats that they used for the Rio scenes, um, steamboats for Osprey and either Penelope or Lady Elizabeth are going to be there. Um, and uh, that I think would be very exciting. 
And, and Peter, I was wondering about, you said that the children are quite easy to work with in terms of doing the makeup. Have you always found that to, to be the case? Is there a certain way of um, interacting with children to make, to engage them in, in that kind of um, uh, exercise? I just think you have to be, you know, very sensitive with them because obviously, you know, the last thing you want to do is upset anybody. And so you can't be, you know, you, you're not going to be demanding at all. But, you know, if you know, if you can explain to them that there's a reason why you're doing something, um, you know, it may be just covering up a blemish or something, then that's that's what you're there to do. And, and they did understand. They were very, I mean, considering what I'm learning a lot tonight anyway about everything that's gone before. But with Sophie, who obviously had some experience, but some of them didn't have experience of acting. But as you as you both said, it's all about the naturalness. They were incredibly natural actors. And I never noticed any hesitation in their dialogue or anything. You know, I mean, I'm I'm not an expert in that in that department. But what I'm saying is I don't remember doing multiple takes, which and, and as uh, Sophie's just explained, the sailing, which I saw the film recently when we did a 50th anniversary screening. Um, those boats were moving really fast. I mean, they weren't, and there was no, I mean, don't quote me on this. So, I mean, the fact that there was limited health and safety regulations as well. So, you know, to have children run, the, there wasn't a, an adult in those boats controlling it, you know, by some magic. It was for children, you know, in the boats, sailing the boats. And, you know, and obviously there were camera crews, as, as Sophie said, on pontoons so, and the weather you know that and there was some seriously strong winds there as well so you know i just thought no the children no when i work with children i've done very many films with children um you just you know you just deal with them they're, they're still actors they're actors and that's what you know you just respect them because acting is an incredible skill which you can have a natural ability as a child which you may not take into adulthood or you can be you know you can start like the children did on swords of amazons and go on to have a full career of acting for the rest of your life so you know it just depends on the individual it depends how they think about the acting when they're doing it as a child a young child and whether they wish to continue and you know and it, it all goes back to this one film that as as we've already discussed, it is timeless. I mean, I've got neighbours in the road I lived, I've lived in over 40 years. And when I made you, I didn't talk to them about this, but I this was months ago. I just happened to be talking to one of the neighbours who'd moved into the road. And he said, oh, didn't you used to work on films? And I said, yes. He said, well, my, my children um, absolutely love Swallows and Amazons. And he said, they watch it all the time. This is this year in 2024. So this is like a, a young child who is fixated with watching Swallows and Amazon and not and not being attached to an iPad with some other unrealistic film on. You know, they're very happy to watch this film still. Because as we've said, it doesn't date. It's not a dated film. And which is great because I'm very happy that we achieved that. I mean. And it was Ronnie and I who achieved that for the, you know, for the period look, because, you know, obviously that's what was required. But um, it was to do with the fact that everybody just, everybody seemed to be enjoying making the movie. I mean, the whole crew, in fact, but also the children definitely looked like they were enjoying it. Although, as Sophie said, some of the conditions were quite difficult and it was quite cold. And they weren't wearing too many clothes as children. And, um, you know, so obviously you can't, I mean, I'm sure they needed to be warmed up by the costume department a few times um, or by other departments to keep them warm. And obviously they had clothing put around them when, when they came, came off the scene. But, um, you know, there wasn't any major issues with the makeup that were, you know, that they got so cold that they went blue. But, <laughs> But no, I mean, it, as I said, it is it's true that what everybody's been saying, the film doesn't date, and that's what makes it so well-liked still. I mean, well-loved still, you know, because 
and it is a classic film. It's not, it wasn't a blockbuster film, but it's a classic film that still people are, as I said to you a few minutes ago, they're literally watching it without any knowledge about me working on it or anything. It's not, it's not they thought, oh, that's a neighbor, I must go and watch that film. They're watching it regularly. Look what I've got here. I've got some of the contact sheets that Richard gave me. All These right. are film stills. And um, I think Ronnie Cogan was very brave because I've got this really irritating, fine, flyaway hair, which when I worked in television production um, later, <laughs> that the makeup artists would be sort of ca very cautious about that and would be lacquering people's hair because it's a nightmare for continuity. But actually, the naturalness of that hair stops the film becoming too famous Fivey or clunky. And it gave it a sort of wilder look. And the fact that our hair was all ruffled and messy and we're camping and sailing. So it would have been ridiculous if it hadn't been. And I think the fact that when I thought about it, I thought, gosh, if I adapted an Arthur Ransom, another Arthur Ransom book, if I was producing one, I'd say, let's let's make this film with no adults in it at all. Um, I don't think that would really work with Arthur Ransom because uh, he had a great affection for the local people like the charcoal burners and the Jacksons and exactly. the and that that had a magic to it. And we had amazing people who you don't sort of they sort of go into the background because they were so natural, like Jack Wilgar and um, John Franklin Robbins, who played the charcoal burners. They just were part of the landscape and they were wearing lovely natural clothes with faded colours. And uh, Brenda Bruce, um, who was Mrs. Dixon, but Mrs. Jackson, uh, she was just played by a local lady. I don't know if she actually had any lines in your script, David, but. Um, Susanna asked her for a frying pan or something and she said a few words and she was just so real and we had a, a lovely girl called Kerry Derbyshire who's coming to uh, Windermere Jetty on the 29th of June. She played the nurse in the opening scenes and she was just perfect and I am, it would be lovely to trace Tiffany Smith who played uh, baby Vicky, the, actually the fifth swallow in the story. Um, but Kerry said she her own daughter was that age with blonde hair. She could have brought her own baby and done it with, with her. But Kerry coped really well with that part and was just very quiet and right somehow to be the nurse. And it just all made sense. And the children were given the freedom to sail off and have their own adventures. Although we were grounded by Virginia McKenna being in the background. But Peter, how did you work with Ronald Fraser? Because he was such a heavy drinker. And <laughs> I know the drivers had a really difficult it, time it with wasn't, him. It wasn't my first um it wasn't my first job. It was my first chief's job. Um he yes, he was a real character. And and obviously I could talk to him. I don't know. I, I've never, it's never really occurred to me how I talk to the actors because I was asked recently, you know, what about so and so's in, in, you know, an actor's personal life? I said, I don't remember having these conversations about people's personal lives with actors. You know, you were either talking about the scene they were going to do or, you know, what they needed for the scene or whatever. I mean, obviously, there were personal conversations all the time. But with Ronnie, it was um, slightly different, uh, to put it mildly. But I had worked with a pre on a previous film where I wasn't a chief, but I was very involved with it, with an actor who was a notoriously very heavy drinker. And on that film, there was a huge scene. I mean, a massively long scene to remember the, the script. I mean, it was a really difficult scene. They couldn't even find the actor um, on the day of shooting at all. And they eventually found him. Um, obviously, he'd been drinking heavily. And they got him to the makeup room. Um, lots of lots of coffee. 
and um, and I thought, well, I don't know how we're ever going to get this scene finished uh, because you know it was pages of dialogue, and it had to be word perfect. And he went onto the set and didn't miss one single word. It was in, it's in the film; it's perfect. And so it was the same with Ronnie when 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 I was starting, you know, like making him up. He may well have been, you know, not concentrating too much on what I was doing. Um, he did have some makeup on, obviously. Um, but it was interesting that, again, having seen the film recently with you, then it's interesting that you it doesn't come across in the in the finished film of how he was. But yes, he was, you know, he he had some pretty ripe dialogue. Um, but no, I don't. I don't remember him bringing any of that personal issues that he had with working to the to the children. You know, I don't remember it being an issue with the children. You know, when we were filming. I mean, uh, in other words, you know, I think he. Well, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he he may not have known all his dialogue, but he certainly presented the dialogue that I saw on the finished film perfectly well. So. No, he knew his dialogue. I we didn't have a great deal of respect for him because he was very um he preferred girls to children. But there were times when he was a father. He had two daughters, and I'm sure he was a good father. And it was great to see him. Um, he actually gelled quite well with Sten Sten Grandon, and uh, Sten grew quite fond of him. Um, he flirted a lot with my mother, which I wasn't too happy about. And we kept, apparently, the children, we we were trying to persuade our driver, Jean, uh, to go out to dinner with him because he was always asking her out to dinner. But the people of the Lake District has never forgotten his um, days with them because he went into every pub and um, was great fun. And he was the one who interacted with the journalists in the bar for which we were grateful because it was difficult for us as children to to chat to the journalists really whereas he loved it and yes. as Susanna once said in those days the drinking went with the territory because so much of his job was in promotion of the films he was in 53 movies or something a huge huge uh film actor uh, amazing things he'd done and he was a real big name and a star at the time, a household name, because he'd been in The Misfits and um, various things. And his friends, I mean, the people who carried his coffin in the end were the actors who played James Bond. He, People were very fond of him. Um, whereas, and some people like the casting, some people find him a bit too uh, stuffy, but... Oh, he he coped with us pretty well. He got really drunk, um, though after maybe once he'd gone home, Peter, because they were doing a pickup shot of the houseboat, and at one stage he was asked to sit in his chair, and we were asked to keep out of sight because presumably they were doing a shot where we weren't meant to be there, and we were lying on the floor. We must be very irritating, and he got furious with us and started throwing books around the cabin. <laughs> and chucked parrot seed all over us. And um, there's a scene when we're sailing Swallow away from the houseboat, at one of the final shots. And I can remember finding parrot seed um, tickling, trickling down my costume. <laughs> but it was the end of, uh, well, really seven weeks of filming. And I expect we were being naughty little monkeys. Um, because we'd grown a bit overconfident by that time. I think as a child, you're bouncing around between being incredibly shy and getting completely precocious when you're doing something like that. And yet it's really important not to get self-conscious. So it was easier for us actually to act in the boats or out on Peel Island where we weren't being watched by anybody. We were just with the film crew. And as you said, Peter, we didn't do a lot of takes on that film. Um, and it wasn't just because the 35 millimeter stock was expensive. It was because 
Claude wanted us to be natural. And in the end, he would say to the lighting camera, and let's film the rehearsal, because often the rehearsal we were at our freshest. Exactly. And then we do one other take, maybe two, to give the editor um, options on when they cut the film, they've got to get the arms and legs working in the right order. Um, and then we move on. And Claude was a great runner. And often what he'd do is, I've forgotten this, but he used to get us running before a scene. Uh, we did a scene above Doe at Water that's actually hit the cutting room floor, but I can remember he got us running before we did that so that we were aerated and fresh and not sort of just that hanging around on your mark and leaping into action. That was a very good idea uh, because it was all, he wanted to see us react, not act. Yeah, well, that's... Um, and those early scenes are the ones I regret uh, because, if anything, we were a bit wooden, a bit too Michael Caine-ish. And uh, although we were bored in the railway carriage, and um, so when I started directing, I used to ask the production manager uh, when we were working with children to schedule just running around scenes for the first two days so the children would get used to working with the crew and working with the director, say, action and cut and that sort of thing. Uh, so that instead of starting with a complicated scene with um, not lots of takes, but lots of different setups, so you've got the wide shot, the two shots, the close-ups, um, which becomes, it, it's surprising if you're not wooden by the end of that, because although there have been a lot of takes, the setups demand that you've repeated the scene a lot. And it's difficult to stay fresh. And I think the thing is, Sophie, that with Claude, I mean, Claude was a lovely director anyway for everybody, including the adults, but also he was a very good director with children. Whereas there are directors I've worked with, we're on a children's, not on a children's film, but on feature films, where they're not very good with children and they obviously prefer with the adult actors. So we were lucky that Claude understood how to direct children and did it very well because, you know, it could have been a lot harder for everybody if he didn't have that natural ability with the children to get the best out of them without pushing them into well now we're on take 15 and they're exhausted and and you're still trying to get that shot that you haven't got so we didn't have that problem as you said and they did yes we did use to shoot the rehearsals which was good the only thing i couldn't get right was actually in the dubbing theater you know swallows and amazons was post synced um i think partly because it was so windy on location our words were blown away so we spent a week post syncing the film at elstree and there was one line I think I might have made up on location because we improvised quite a bit. And that was, and thank you so much for letting us see your lovely serpent. And I couldn't replicate what I'd said on location. So I think they tried to use the original <laughs> sound um, for that. But um, when we shot that scene with the charcoal burners, there was so much wind in the trees that it spoilt the sound. And there were also difficult things in the Lake District, like you'd hear a modern car toot their horn as they went by, or you'd hear a motorboat or something like that. So it must have been expensive um, to post sync it, but we had a brilliant, brilliant um, dubbing mix uh, in um, Bill Rowe, who won Oscars for sound. And I think that Swallows and Amazons was very much made by the sound, and it was brilliant that they, um, use sound to illustrate Titty's imagination. So you can hear the wind in the palm trees and the clanking of the bell when she's being Robinson Crusoe being shipwrecked on her desert island. And you hear parrots in the trees, just hear them. And, and monkeys chattering. And so her imagination is created with sound, which was can't have been that expensive or taken too long to do, and yet it's absolutely brilliant. And children watching really respond to that. Um, I had to imagine it at the time. In fact, I didn't even know they were going to do that. And so much better, I think, than in Miss Potter when her characters come alive. You know, you could 
kind of do it with animation or something like that, but it costs a lot more. And it just spoils the the magic of it, really. Yeah. Um, and people love the natural history inserts, the geese and um, the owls and the woodpecker and the, the squirrels in the trees. And I think they got that right with the cattle at dawn and the, the it's really a landscape movie. Um, <laughs> well, it's, it was a wonderful landscape, but I, I just, I mean, I'm maybe asked about this later, but the charcoal burning scene was amazing because you know, that, they built a real charcoal burning area, you know, like a, a set. And, you know, you were, they were crawling in there to work in, you know, to do the filming inside there. It was just remarkable. And, and they were, and they needed a lot of makeup to make them look like real charcoal burners, which of course was, and well, it still is, but not in that manner anymore. But in those days, they were still charcoal burners making charcoal. Um, for for you know for drawing and everything, and it was just an incredible you know, scene because that so easily could have been you know not it couldn't have, it wouldn't have been featured as well on some other films, but they took a lot of effort into making that scene very real, and it was real, and they you know the actors loved it as well. Well, you did really well because I know that Jack will go was younger than I am now. <laughs> he was playing old Billy and then young Billy was also meant to be like an old man. And exactly. you when I I've, I've got some of mum's behind the scenes photographs and you, you can't really distinguish the actors from the real charcoal burners who were there helping to dress and set up the scene. But I can remember the props guys in the heap which wasn't real. It, they they made the the heap. And they then made they, the heat, but it looked real. It looked real. And they had their smoke guns inside that heap. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and they got very, very smoky. But the wigwam, I don't know if the wigwam was real, the charcoal burner's hut, um, where we had a real fire, that got quite smoky as well. Um, but it was amazing. And we really did film inside it. Exactly. We definitely filmed inside it because I had to go inside <laughs> it to check them. <laughs> yeah. No, it was great. I mean, that's what I mean about the film. It had lots of magic moments. I mean, you know, which, you know, that, I mean, I was lucky to work on some very good films subsequently, um, even before this film. But no, the, there were moments in Swallows and Amazons that were unique, you know, so because they took the effort. And it goes back to what we've repeatedly said, you know, it is a very, very realistic, natural film. You know, which is why it lasts, you know, we're talking about it 50 years ago, and 50 years ago, 51 years ago, it's amazing. I think um, one thing that I always feel is that the music was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, Wilfred Josephs, uh, who he did um, I, Claudius, for instance, I mean, he did a, a lot of television themes, but um, that uh, uh, music throughout, uh, I think is very, very special. We were very lucky. And that uh, that was Claude's choice or decision. Um, he, I think, knew Wilfred, or Wilfred may have done uh, other shows with him. Um, the, the, the other thing from what you've been saying, going back to Ronald Fraser, when I heard he'd been cast, I, I, I wasn't sure about the casting. I thought, is this going to be... Uh, a bit of a send up. Uh, I, I sensed that he was uh, a, a comedian, really. But I have to say that what I thought was wonderful in that performance was the way he attacked John and then later on apologized to John. And I think that is very moving moment. That is very, very real. Um, and I've got a thing about children understanding injustice, uh, fairness. It's not fair. Yeah. We all learn at a very, very young age. <laughs> one is given one piece of chocolate and another is given two pieces. It's not fair. Um, and that feeling, and also Simon, I thought was 
extremely good in those scenes um, where you saw how hurt he was that he'd been accused of being a liar. Um, but I was not only relieved, but I was delighted with the way Ronald Fraser actually took that seriously. He didn't try to send it up in any way at all. Well, I think going back to him, I mean, the fact is, I've worked on, as I said, many films around that period as well, where actors were, I mean, drink was the um, choice that they took, you know, where they would, you know, they, they used to sit on a, on a set and, you know, there'd be three or four of them and they'd, they'd all be, you know, heavily drinking, you know, during the day and, and certainly at night. And the thing with that was it wasn't because there was certainly no evidence in my in my working time of that period with drugs, but you know, drink was for was the choice of a lot of actors, and it was difficult for companies employing them because you know I'm not going to name names, but there were many that I worked with who were equally as good as Ronald, you know, in that case, in that department. But the thing about Ronald is, I think. David is that he actually recognized, even though it might have been difficult for him at times, he recognized how good the children were in the film and how sincere they were for the story that they were trying to come across. But I think he did, he was able to act correctly, you know, in those scene, in those sequences, because he he respected the fact of what the children were presenting him with. Had they have not been so representative of what was correct for the film he might have you know as you said not behaved very well and it could have made the film a very much more difficult film mm. to be finished but in fact i agree with you that you know there were some very very emotional moments with the children and him mm. and as you said he did step up to the plate but that's what i said about the other actor i was telling you about earlier it's the fact is you know the fact that you couldn't even couldn't even speak a word when he, they found him, and yet two hours later, he did probably the one of the best speeches ever of any actor in living and dead, living and now dead. You know, so it just proves that actors who could drink can also very often act very well, and subsequently, you know, and, and <laughs> as a normal human being and not an actor, it's quite hard to understand that, but they were able to. Hmm. Well, but Ronald Fraser was also very good with a parrot. And they had that, that scene when he's writing. It's a short scene, but there is writing and the parrot's on his shoulder and the firework goes off on the roof. Oh, that's extraordinary. The parrot was quite tricky. The parrot <laughs> came from Kendall and one of the drivers said he often had to go and collect the parrot. Then the parrot wasn't used. And this would have been okay if, he corrected the parrot in the great big cage, but the parrot travelled in a little zip-up shopping bag and he felt it couldn't stay in the shopping bag all day. But I really did have the parrot on my shoulder and he, he had very sharp claws. They do. <laughs> so I think I did quite well acting with the parrot because the parrot was scary. I thought it might take a chunk out of my face or fly off. Um, because we were on the houseboat in the middle of Dark Water. It wasn't a set. It exactly. was a real deal. Um, but um, they finally put a, a drape over the parrot's cage. So actually, when we, we sail away, there is no parrot in that cage. Um, just the parrot seat down my blouse. Um, but I think Arthur Ransom was very clever in the structure of the book to make Titty, the, the little girl, the heroine, because... She isn't thrilled a lot. And you have her, you see it right at the beginning, David, when she's in the train and she's letting her imagination go wild and she's talking about camels crossing the Sahara Desert. And then at the crucial moment, she's trying to tell Captain Flint that she heard the burglars. And Susan says, oh, Titty, you know, they didn't believe her. And she did hear the burglars. And they were real burglars. And she does know where the treasure's hidden. And they don't believe her. So she goes off with her brother all by herself. Which is much better, I think, than in the book. Where I don't think Arthur Atson wanted the book to end. So they go back much later. And they all find the treasure together, buried. And there's a carved fish. And it, it works. It makes the book a lot longer. But 
you don't have to compress it because a film has to be 90 minutes. And I think you did that really, really well, um, structurally, but also giving Titty that extra bit of courage to get up early in the morning and row out to that island and then find the burglar's pipe and find the treasure with Roger. Um, and I think the way they set up finding the treasure under the uh, the tree with the tree roots going up like in the in the book's um, illustration was really good, the way the, the stones slide off it. And I only wish I hadn't jumped out of the way too soon. I was told to do that because they didn't want me to be injured. But I had Peter to cover up my bruises. We were always getting bruised and scratched and cut, weren't we, Peter? Oh dear. Well, that's why I said to you, this is what you do as a makeup artist. You know, it's not what the audience sees. That what the audience sees is a continuity of, you know, of the whole film from A to Z. But what you do is, you know, one day you look perfectly okay and there's nothing needs to be done. And the next time you've been bruised or you've, you know, fallen or you've grazed your knee or, you know, which isn't a part of the script. So that's what you're there to do, to cover up those, you know, those natural occurrences that, you know, and obviously there's one that we haven't discussed yet, Sophie, which we may get to, which... Is oh, the, disaster. Yes, I've got it. The Look. famous... The famous titty, yes, the film canister, because you tell. I mean, you can either start this story or I can I can tell it what happened. But you know, a lot of people comment on this because they know the film and they watch it. What happened was that <laughs> I was quite a late developer, as you can tell from watching the film. Um, but I still had some of my milk teeth. And although you sent us to the dentist before we set off to have our teeth cleaned, I lost a tooth in the worst possible circumstances. We were in the middle of the scenes shot on Peel Island, me and Virginia McKenna, and they're talking about cannibals and jumping out of cauldrons. And in the middle of that scene, actually it was overnight, but we'd shot half the scene and still had to wave Virginia goodbye. My eye tooth fell out in the middle of the night and I know that you had to rush off to the dentist with the tooth to see if a bridge could be made but Claude Wotham just decided oh we'll live with it but the scenes that were shot we shot the scenes of us sailing to the island uh, on some of the very last days they were shot, um, a lot of them were shot on Derwent Water when we were up there doing those final scenes with the houseboat. And you can see clearly that I've lost a tooth here. And the tooth just goes in and out all by itself. You can tell what order the film was shot, whether I've got the tooth or not. So I'm really sorry about that. Um, and a friend of mine has drawn the most beautiful picture of Titty. Well, me being titty, I'll get it out. It's all wrapped up to go to Cumbria. But uh, I've got this certain look on my face and I'm someone who often has an open mouth, which isn't great because I don't have good teeth. Um, and in that scene, I very purposely had my mouth shut tightly when I wasn't speaking because of the problem of having just lost a tooth and it was all sore and really visible. Let me open this. Oh gosh, sorry about the noise. This is the picture that Caroline has paint drawn of Titty. And I think it's brilliant. I think it encapsulates so much about the film. The sort of sincerity of the look on her face and the flyaway hair. And she's really listening. And it wasn't difficult to listen to Virginia McKenna's story. But I think that's what it's about. The film's about stories and listening to stories and acting out those stories, like being part of the chair of Treasure Island scenario and um, Stout Cortez on the peak at Darien. So <laughs> the, the, the lost tooth, and Peter kept it in this, remember those, you must it's have had the film. 35 mil film canister of that period. 
Yeah. And um, the reason, I mean, I, we did go to a, a dentist to see if we could get something done. But in the end, it wasn't necessary for the, you know, for the director. He didn't want it. And I kept the tooth in that canister. I put a tooth in the canister. And it was over 40 years later, probably 45 years later, that um, it came up in a conversation from Sophie on the, one of the television programs. And, I con and we got into contact and I said, I think I've still got your tooth somewhere. And it's called Titty's, it's on the label Titty's Tooth. The label yeah. is a bit of camera tape. A little bit of camera tape. A little exactly. camera tape. I was very keen on the camera tape. I thought period, period camera was tape. marvelous. And at the very last scene, um, the director of photography, Dennis Lewiston, gave me a reel of camera tape, and wow. ironically, <laughs> and ironically, it was extraordinary. I went on to work um, behind the camera for the BBC, and I used to have oh about five different colored rolls of camera tape in my possession because I started off working as a assistant floor manager and I was the girl who who marked up the rehearsal rooms and marked up all the actors' positions with camera tape. There we are. So anyway, so the tooth has got returned to the real rightful owner. I haven't opened it. Oh, horrible. No, the it's, still, it's still in there. I've got some, a bit of memorabilia here. This is one of the Amazon's arrows, fletched with um, green, they're meant to be parrot's feathers. I think they came off a um, fancy dress outfit that the assistant um, director found in Ambleside. And then Richard sent me from um, America the white elephant, the Captain Flint's flag um, flown from the house boat, which we captured. So I've got that, which is rather special. And I think was made on location probably by Simon Holland, the designer, um, who you must have got to know well working on other films. Um, I want to know, Peter, what the favourite film of all time was that you've worked on in your long <laughs> career. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, a, that's such a hard question to answer uh, because... It's not that, yeah. I mean, obviously I should say Swallows and Amazons, um, not, not for the obvious reason that it was my first film as a chief, so it is very important to me. But I think um, uh, it's so hard to, to talk about, uh, I mean, yeah, there, are, there are a couple of iconic films that I've worked on and, and they still, you know, we're still talking about it, and they are also coming up for major anniversaries. So, I mean, the Rocky Horror Picture Show is obviously one of them oh, wow. because that was over fifty. That was fifty years ago now as well. Um, so you know, it's just difficult to say. But but there's so. I mean, the man who would be king, where I wasn't the chief, but I was. I was like the second, and that was a brilliant film to work on with John Huston. You know, there and um, you know, there, there's just so many. It, it depends on whether you're looking at the films that became big successes, or whether you're looking at films where the director was so important. You know, even though the film weren't necessarily the best films ever, but they were. When you're working with brilliant directors, you know that you're on something very unique, and so it's very hard to to choose a film from the best because I was fortunate to work on a lot of very good films, I mean, excellent films. So therefore, you know, if a list is quite long of the ones that are the, from the most favorite because there is no way of separating them really. I mean, you know, I, I was very fortunate to have some great actors and, you know, the moments that I, you know, it, it's, it's very hard to explain that when, you, when you're working with, I mean, I was personal makeup to Laurence Olivier. You know, that was brilliant to work on that film with him when he was not a well man, but he was absolutely wonderful to work with. And, you know, it's just interesting that, you know, no one, I, I, would, I would literally have moments in my career where I'll be in the middle of a rice paddy field in, in Sri Lanka or, 
you know, somewhere miles away in the, across the world thinking, what am I doing here? How am I so lucky to be here on a film that's, you know, because we shot on real locations. And that's the difference to nowadays where a lot of it's done in green screen or whatever color screen it's now using or in a, in a, in a cube, which has got magic, magic facilities. But being on location and being on real locations, which are, in my career was very common in England, whereas in America, they normally built sets. They built huge sets, which were brilliant, but they didn't go on location that, as much as they did from here. So yeah, that's the thing that they, 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 those are the experiences that I really remember. And um, and when somebody says to me, you know, like, what have you worked on? And I say, well, you can look me up and see. Then they ask me about a film, doesn't matter which one it is. That often is a film that has either great merit as a, being a very successful film or great merit as being interesting makeup or whatever. So as I said, it's very hard to pick one. So I'm going to have to um, leave it like that. Uh, I had a question from Catherine for, for David. Uh, what was the hardest scene to, to write and, and why? Oh dear. Um, uh, no, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a, a, a tricky one. Th those scenes that we've just talked about, which are the, the sort of human um seems interestingly the interaction between an adult and a child but seeing it from a child's point of view uh those uh the, john talking to his mother when he comes and, uh, and and when they've been perhaps um foolhardy and um going off on the adventure and leaving titty in the boat uh i remember that and and the ones with john and uh, uncle jim Captain Flint. Um, uh, the, 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 it's interesting, really, because uh, those are straight scenes. Uh, there's no looking for humour. Uh, there's no, you know, because Roger is a great source of, of humour. Uh, the danger is, is that you make him look silly. It's got to come from him. Actually, Claude was very, very good at, at emphasising that. Um, Titty uh as sophie said titty is the most imaginative one of the four and therefore uh the scene i i, I remember doing the the thing on, on on the island where she's on her own and i was hoping that they would do some sort of imaginative thing i didn't want them to suddenly change the background and suddenly she's on a real desert island. it's it's in her head uh, and it is subtly done with those sound effects. Um, but uh, that, that, those scenes I remember in, enjoying doing particularly. Uh, I don't know about them being uh, difficult. Funnily enough, the one right at the beginning, again, that Sophie mentioned, which isn't in the book, that when they're on the train, I use things that are in the book. Um, I think the camels were somewhere else and the fact that uh, the mother comes from Australia, uh, and I, I I wanted to establish the family before we got to the Lake District. The book starts off with Roger tacking across the field, uh, which is lovely, um, and we, indeed we do that. But I wanted this, if you like, prologue, uh, whereby we learnt that they were a family, we learnt that the father was not with them, we learnt that he was um, sailing on, on a big ship, uh, and... Uh, uh, but so by the time we get there, we sort of know that we've got uh, uh, four children, two girls, two boys. We know that Susan is the slightly more motherly one uh, and that John is the eldest and obviously maybe the most um, responsible, if you like. And we know that uh, Roger is, um, is, is, is keen. I mean, I love it when Roger says, why, why doesn't he just say yes? Um, and the father has sent this rather ambiguous or uh, tricky telegram. Um, and, and again, Claude was very clever at getting that sort of line out of a, out of a child uh, without it being too adultly said. And I don't know, this may be controversial now, but I, I think The Railway Children is a wonderful film. But I do think that some of the... Um, 
lines come out in a very adult or very um, not in tongue in cheek that they don't seem to me to emanate from a child, um, particularly uh, Sally Thompson, who I loved and I mean was was considerably older than the part she was playing. Um, but I'd never quite believe uh, the lines. It's as though they have been written. They were very much scripted and they were very much on the lines and they were very aware of the fact that they were a line which meant the child was uh, being funny or was commenting in a certain way. Um, and I think uh, I, I give Claude the credit for this because he didn't want that to happen. And I don't think it did. I don't know whether that answers the question, but it's uh, kept me going for a while. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I just want to touch, we've had some questions about some of the other cast members. I just wanted to ask about the uh, the, the Blackett. So uh, uh, Kit Seymour and Leslie Bennett, were they, uh, Peter and Sophie, you remember those two actresses? Um, yes, um, and they were amazing. It was difficult for them because uh, unlike when you schedule a film, uh, often, well, production saves money by just asking the actors to come up to the location when they, their scene is being done. But because of the unpredictability of the weather, and I think probably because Paul and Richard wanted us to gel as a, a team, the Amazons came up from the very beginning and the film's mainly about the swallows, so they had an awful lot of hanging around on location, which was very frustrating for them. They had to do their schoolwork. We, we all had to do our schoolwork at least 15 hours a week. And we did this in a double-decker bus. I can remember, PC, you had a funny little caravan for the makeup with <laughs> terrible orange curtains. He had, it, was, it was a tiny caravan, but at least it was warm. And this doubled up as um, Virginia McKenna's, um, what would you call it, her, her caravan. It wasn't spacious, it was just a little one that was towed from one location to another around the Lake District between these, down these tiny lanes between pretty robust dry stone walls. And our double-decker buses must have followed Peter's caravan into these inaccessible locations like the Grisdale Forest or to Elterwater. And that's where we changed into our costumes and had our lesson. And so they were part of the team. And I think they did brilliantly because, and it was lovely when we were all together, like on Peel Island, and suddenly we were the Swallows and the Amazons. And that was great fun. And the highlight, of course, was this, were the scenes on the houseboat where we were all together. I was quite um, jealous of Nancy and Peggy's red hats because it gave them some warmth, especially when we were sailing. But once we were actually in the houseboat, they got rather hot and then they're stuck with a red hat, boiling their brains. Uh, but they weren't easy parts. And yet um, Kit Seymour was so beautiful and yet so... Uh, just the epitome of uh, incredibly um, suave tomboy. And she did it all so brilliantly. And it's terrifying when the Amazons are running down into secret harbour. There's this little girl just getting the boat out in time. Um, and you're thinking, oh, blimey, what are they going to do to her? It really is quite scary without being ridiculous um, or... Uh, fabricated jeopardy or, or something it's their territory and they're the local girls and they're quite sophisticated uh, while still being believable as 12 year old children um, the secret is that actually Leslie was the one of us she played Peggy she was actually 13 um, and Kit had her birthday during the filming so she turned 13 the whole film was made quite illegally because my mother was a chaperone and we were on location far longer than children that age were legally allowed to be on location at the time. And we, I didn't do nearly enough schoolwork. And mum thought it was absolutely fine for me to film six days a week. It's not legal at all. But we were bursting with energy. And if anything, we were much less tired than the older actors got hanging around in the cold 
It was extraordinary to make a film that was filmed on the water so much. I mean, it's so many of the scenes are set actually on the water, but I think that's what makes it special. I think it's one of the great sailing films of us, myself. Well, it was unique. I mean, it was a unique production for that reason. And also it was unique that the, 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 the children were there all the time. And that's that again, that, that certainly doesn't happen you know, in subsequent films where, you know, where as, as, as you said earlier, that, you know, you get an actor on one day there's availability and then they would go away and you know you might see them in three weeks time but on this film they were there all the time as you just explained and that's what made you know, they were in but obviously in many scenes but it, when there were long breaks in between where they weren't filming you know they were very happy to come and you know be got ready to go to work but you know they but but they all interacted anyway off camera as well as on camera. And that's the thing I think that made it very special. You know, I'm sure Sophie, well, she hasn't said it, but I think all the children, and you know, so they were, as you said, some of them were, became teenagers. They were all very friendly with each other, even though it wasn't in the storyline, but it was in real life. They were all got on very well together, but the whole group of the children. So I think it was, you know, that's what made the film special. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, Simon West was a year younger than us, actually. He doesn't show because he's so bright, but he was actually shorter than me, so he often had to stand in a box or they dig me a little trench. He was a couple of inches shorter than me, but I think it worked because none of us fell in love with him because we were a year older. Um, I think that in the 70s, they had no idea what um, sweets would do to an eight-year-old boy, so it was... Um, driving us bonkers sometimes because he'd just take, I don't know, a hammer out of the chippy's um, box and use it as a machine gun and be machining gun down, machine gun down the journalists. Um, but it was unique to have us there as a little ensemble on location for the entire shoot. And I suppose because we didn't earn very much and we just stayed at a guest house, it was the cost was negligible and yet it gave the um, production flexibility um, and didn't break the magic so we were together for the whole time and that was important it's actually the scheduling of the film impacted me and that I realized that it's actually unless you've got the lead part as an actor it's much more fun to work on the crew because then you are there for the whole duration of the film and it's much more yours um, than if you coming in and out as an actor or um you're just doing an odd day and it's a bit overwhelming and you turn up and you do your scene and you're gone um and in fact that's when your relationship with your makeup artist particularly is really important because that whole process of sitting down in the nice warm camera van at the beginning of the day often quite early and just adjusting to working with the film crew um, is really important to, to, to ground you and introduce you as an actor to it all. Um, I did a few, I did have another, I was a, the lead in another movie when I was about 15. And then I did a few small parts really to pay my way through university. And the difference was uh, extraordinary, especially when I did have to have a lot of makeup. I was a film extra in Tenko. Oh, the horror of having dreadful KY jelly threaded into my hair and being covered in dirt to be a female prisoner of war. Oh, um, and my sister was involved in a fire scene there and had to have the most terrible wounds. Um, and then the ordeal of driving off at the end of the day in your own car and having to fill up your car with fuel at the petrol station looking like a an injured prisoner of war <laughs> that was quite um a strange thing to happen um but I, people ask me when i came back from filming swallows and amazons often the 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 first question my school friends asked for instance was oh did you wear makeup and that was difficult for me because well we weren't wearing mascara <laughs> But Peter was there to um, hide our bruises or scratches or 
you gave us more of a tan in the later scenes um so that when we were in the the beginning we're the swallows we're just arriving on holiday so we're quite wan looking and then after the end of the week we're more we're more tanned um I don't really tan myself actually so I spoiled that idea but <laughs> um it we were given a healthy glow by you Peter and there you go. much more attractive than <laughs> I was wondering, uh, David, because it is quite a, it's very, it must be quite a descriptive script that you would have done because, of course, the, 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 the boat sequences, the, all the sailing is, is probably more than perhaps there is dialogue in, in the film. Were you, was, was that a challenge in terms of, of doing things? Did you have to leave it open enough so that the locations dictate kind of how it went? Or were you giving lots of options in terms of, of the physical actions of, of, of the piece? Um, well, we we went on location, looking for locations uh, before before I wrote the script. Um, so I'd been uh, on at least two lakes, I think, and I'd seen the sort of houses that they might use. Um, uh, I'd seen the island. Uh, I'd seen the view. The, so I had a picture in my mind of, of what might happen. Um, and also there were uh, little things like where we were uh, we were on a motorboat uh, going past uh, Bowness, which became Rio in the film. And, uh, and I saw that there was a little bandstand on the uh, on the shore. Uh, and I immediately noted that I wrote that down and I thought, oh, it'd be lovely if we could have a little brass band playing in the bandstand in one scene. And that was uh, that I really was thrilled that they did that uh, because it didn't have to. It's not in the book. Um, but that thing of just using what what you've got. Um, but uh, no, I, I the, the, the whole thing of sailing, I could sort of imagine it in my head and I got to understand the language as used in the book, but one obviously knew that uh, when they were actually out there uh, without any life jackets, of course, uh, <laughs> doing it, uh, it, it, what I was writing would, would would not necessarily be exactly what they would say, uh, but that was fine. Um, the, 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 the I saw a question come up on the screen about the scripts that I wrote for the other ones um they i don't know that they're available in the sense of you can't buy them but they are in my so-called archive uh which is at seven stories in newcastle seven stories is uh it's a wonderful place the center for the children's book where they have exhibitions they have talks they have um a wonderful bookshop they have storytellings um a great children's um place to go uh, and they also have a collection of uh, children's authors and illustrators work. Uh, they were the first to really show an interest in children's work. Uh, I mean, you know, if you were somebody called Harold Pinter, your papers and your, uh, your bits and pieces could be sold for millions to an American university. But children's thing didn't have that same appeal. Uh, now, um, uh, a lot of well-known children's writers do donate their archives. It's not a question of money, but you, you uh, I mean, I, I, I was delighted to feel that all my stuff, because I never throw anything away, so they're, they're box files of stuff, uh, and uh, I didn't want the idea of our daughters having to uh, decide what to do with this thing, all, the, all this stuff. So uh, I was very pleased when they offered to take it. And uh, people like Michael Morpurgo, um, his archive is there. Judith Carr, who wrote The Tiger, who came to tea, of which I did the stage version. Her stuff is there. Lots and lots of others. And um, and it is available. I mean, if you get in touch with them in, in the um, collections department, the archivists will arrange a time when you can actually go and look in a file and you can look at these scripts and read them. Uh, I don't know, it'd be interesting. I haven't read them for years and years and years. But I, <laughs> I think um, 
I seem to remember thinking that the Great Northern one was really rather good uh, because I like the book apart from the arts the, and the story. It's quite a strong story. Um, but uh, no, it just was never made. Maybe the time is coming. Maybe it's all going to happen suddenly. Well, I hope so. I have got the script here that ah. I never saw on location. And these yellow pages are the, what we really did. Like, they're not rewrites, but um, they're, they're what actually got shot, dated. And I can show people what you wrote all that time ago. Oh, dear. <laughs> you were talking about Rio. You've written XX, Exterior Rio Harbour Day. Swallow glides far past boat houses. John says they've given us the, the slip. The children look crestfallen. Um, Roger especially. Susan, let's go and explore Rio. We could get rope for the lighthouse. I think in reality, I well, in the film, I said we could get rope for the lighthouse tree. All right, Roger, stay here. Look after Swallow. Swallow bumps gently against the landing stage. Interior Rio Gen interior. Rio General Store Day. Jumble of jars, boxes and bottles on shelves. Titty eyes them. A wireless plays in the background. Roy Fox and his band. They change that. The shopkeeper measures the length of rope. He was played by a Mr. Turner. <laughs> uh, four bottles of grog, please. Susan looked at him. Ginger beer. It's a grand day. Yes, isn't it? Rio landing stage. Roger Garge Swallow. A very ordinary man approaches. Roger looks suspicious. Ma'am, that's a fine little ship you've got there. Oh, no, you've written, that's a fine little ship you have there. Yes, that's Roger. Holiday crowd, shops, butterfly nets, fishing rods, postcards. In the park, a nearby military band plays on a bandstand. It was actually the Kendall Borough Band. Ah. Uh, of course. John, Susan and Titty gaze through a tea shop window at, at homemade cakes. They look at each other. Do you know Ian Whitaker, who was a set um, dresser, who went on to win two Oscars for set dressing, he made the most wonderful, glorious bun shop and we ran out of time and never used it. So, uh, shame. Such a shame. Anyway, then you do see us walking along the Rio landing stage. Jetty, jetty, David. A ticket office, a ticket office advertises sheen ship excursions. Steamship excursions. Roger watches ducks playing. It was actually my sister's playing on the on the shore with Pandora Doyle, the publicity um, manager's daughter, <laughs> and Jane Grendon, Sten's mother, who was looking after them, and my father in a rowing boat. Um, but anyway, you written John, Susan, and Titty return carrying a coil of rope, bottles of ginger beer, and a large bag of buns. They hand their purchases to Roger to stow and swallow. Anything to report, boy Roger? One of the natives came up and said, that's a fine little ship I had there. What did you say? I said, yes. <laughs> and Sten says that's his favourite line of the script. And they're always using it in that, that their family. I said, yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I'm not replicating our dialogue very well, but I should know it better. Um, but this is it, and I think I must take it to um, Cumbria to get the other cast members and you, David, to sign it, and then it becomes a historic document. <laughs> we go on Antiques Roadshow again, even. It's now, probably I'm the only that. one in the world. Somebody you said were on the before. Antiques Roadshow this week, Sophie. Yeah, you know that. that was quite good, um, given that we it was quite good. It was just chance, but it's quite good publicity, I suppose, for Wendy Majetti. So, David, that's what the actuals look like. I don't know what you call them. Do you call them actuals? Typed up, I presume, maybe by the script supervisor you call um, her now. We called her um, Sue a continuity girl at the time. I don't want a parrot. Can, I, can you bring me a monkey, please? With or without a tail? With a tail, please. The others are only apes. Sen found that very difficult to say, but he, he said it. Yes, I don't know that that was mine. I don't think I remember writing that. <laughs> but well, it was, okay, it was all, all good stuff. All good stuff. Um, no, I think they, they do a script at the end, which is sort of a definitive script of what actually uh, is on the finished product. And uh, I remember 
there was another thing of, of, of mine where they sent me that. I didn't necessarily want to receive it, but I was happy to. <laughs> It's Uncle Jim goes into the forecastle and comes back with the accordion. They all rise and start to clear the cabin table. Say pieces of eight. Say it just once. Pieces of eight. Pieces of eight. Everyone stops in surprise and looks at the parrot. Shiver my timbers. He never said it for us. I say, Titty, it is a long time to wait till I come back in the spring. Ronald Fraser was taught to play the accordion by Mrs. Capstick at Ambleside. Um... And he played, what shall we do with the drunken sailor, which was quite apt. <laughs> and then, um, I think years later, around the time of the 40th anniversary, Richard Pilbrow, the producer, was invited to London because the Central School of Music and Dramatic Art, where he said he um, sometimes went to when he was a student, decided to give him an honorary degree. And Susanna had also been to the Central as a, to, to, to study acting. And I contacted Richard and Molly, or they were in contact with me, and he kindly invited us to lunch, Susanna and I, in Covent Garden. We had this lovely lunch with Richard and Molly. They both worked on the, the film. And that's when he told me that he said he just didn't think he managed to raise the money to make Great Northern apart from anything else because there was roaring inflation in the 70s. Um, but he told me then that Mrs. Ransom um, had a, a stern comment to make about the period of the kettle, which I didn't think was terribly important. Um, but Susanna and I, after having had this lovely lunch where we'd reminisced about the film, we burst out of the restaurant. Outside, there were some buskers and they were playing a version of What Should We Do With a Drunken Sailor? <laughs> she looked at me and I looked at her and she said, what are the chances of that? And we bustled away and we came to the main road above this street in Covent Garden. And Susanna said, that's where we held the premiere. And she's looking up at the Odeon Cinema. And I said, oh, no, we held the premiere at the ABC in Shaftesbury Avenue. She said, yes, it's now an Odeon. And what I've got here, somehow this survived. This survived, this has survived 50 years, and it's the dress I wore to the premiere. <laughs> and I don't know, where did you go, Peter? Did you go, David? I no, couldn't go, I was in a... We would only be, we, we, we were never invited to premieres, <laughs> it, it, ever. We were only invited to cast and crew screenings. Oh, uh, terrible, terrible. I, was, I think I was in Manchester, I was doing a play in Manchester as an actor, um, so I couldn't get there. Oh, we would have loved you to be there because well, as children, we love being on location and making the film and the sailing and being, you know, acting out the pages of the book. But we found the publicity very difficult and strange and alien. And we didn't think that we deserved to be in that kind of dreadful sort of film star mode. We, we weren't into that at all. Um, in fact, we it kind of put us all off acting, if anything like that. But Bobby Moore came to the premiere and Simon was really pleased about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I found it all like acutely embarrassing because A, you've got to see and hear yourself on the screen and you just see all your failings and it's awful. And B, because my friends, you know, we hadn't particularly invited them, but a lot of people I knew turned up and that was really shy making. Um, and Ronald Fraser really looked after us actually, but I wish you'd been there as well, David, to help <laughs> help um, things along. But it was very daunting. It was on a double bill actually with The Exorcist. Uh, I don't know if uh, good, good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a double bill with The Exorcist, but The Exorcist was on as a, alternative on another screen in the ABC it wasn't a double bill I think eventually it was a double bill with an elephant called Slowly that Virginia McKenna and her husband Bill Travers had worked on Bill actually came up on location for the scene that we shot with Virginia on um, Peel Island when I lost my tooth I totally forgot he was there but I spied him in one of mum's photographs that she took on location um, and I think that 
I don't know if it was on with Ring of Bright Water at all, but you used to get a B movie in those days, if you remember. Um, I do remember watching the film at our local cinema and a boy in front of me standing up at the end and turning round and looking at me and looking back at the screen. And, yeah. <laughs> I did Titty get behind me. Um, and, and, you know, as a child, you have to cope with that. And I just smiled and ably and said, yeah, it is me. <laughs> um, and then just went back to school in a very ordinary existence, um, which uh, was fine. Um, but it does force you to grow up a bit and um, be grown up before your time in some respects um but hey it's not agonizing uh, worse things have happened um but it was a remarkable thing because i hadn't ever dreamt of being an actor it wasn't something that i really really wanted to do anything like that i think that i projected myself into the characters in the book when I read them. And I think that that's the great thing about your script and the film is that children, they keep saying that they, telling me that they really identify with my character or one of the other characters, particularly Nancy, and that they've become their friends. And certainly the characters in the book are definitely uh, are, people see them as their friends and they've helped them through their lives and the book and the film have offered solace and friendship uh, that's really lasted people their whole lives long and, and as a result it's I think terribly important we're, we're doing up the dinghies that appeared in the film the Arthur Ransom Society have just acquired both of them and they've raised the funds to do them up and we're the next thing to raise funds for is I think it's really important to take them to people so people can actually touch them and see them. They're going to be based on the Norfolk Broads because there's a wonderful um, boat yard there called Hunter's Yard who've already got the boat we used as the Teasel and the dinghy we used as Titmouse in uh, Coot Club and the Big Six. We used it as one of the locations. It's the boat yard, real boat yard, well, the boat yard in the stories. Um, which Arthur Ratson must have known himself because he took yachts from there, I believe. Uh, and they are renovating the boats and they're the one company that have got the skills to keep them in top condition, renovate them and keep them over the winter. And also ensure families so that you can go and sail them so you can book um, a holiday with them. But also I'm quite keen to take them to... Um, festivals like we've taken them to the Southampton boat show the big boat show and it's delightful to watch people arrive at the boat show and they see swallow and they come up to me and they said this is the boat of my dreams this is my dream boat <laughs> the boats have got a character of themselves and they almost um sing to you don't they when they're sailing and some a reader has just suggested that we ought to take the boats to the hay festival which would be wonderful um, next summer because people see those boats as they walk um we've had them outside we've had swallow outside cinemas for instance and it's like it is swallow and there she is and you can touch her and you can imagine what it would be like to sail off to a desert island in her i, I just want to as we start to to wrap up just to ask some of the other about some of the other cast members um just what what they were like really uh jack Wolgar. John Robbins, um, you've got, well, maybe you'll start with, with those two, first of all. For me, oh, Jack Wolgar was amazing because he kept in character, they both kept in character the whole time, which was really important to us. And he grew up, I think, in Lancashire and he had this lovely Lancashire accent. And before the charcoal burner scene, they were setting up the smoke and smoke guns and we were hanging around. And he said, um, let's just go through, run through our line, shall we? We haven't done that with Claude. Well, he'd run through the lines with us, I suppose. But we, we, we haven't done it with the other uh, adult actors. And he started talking and he had such a lovely musical voice. And he's, 
rattling on and on and on and on and on. And then he says, and then you'll be getting in the minibus and going back to Ambleside. And I'm looking at him and saying, that's not in the script. And he said, hey, lass, he said, you didn't come in on your cue. <laughs> oh, no, I was just listening to you. <laughs> so I completely captured by his magical aura. Um, whereas John, his character Robbins, who was playing his son, was more like... Um, stern young billy but remained in character um virginia was very warm and easy to work with and she had a style a charm that was contagious and you can see me kind of adopting that style and um as a child would i suppose um when we're sitting around the campfire crying pemmican uh, by ourselves but there's not very many adult parts in it so um, Mr. The, the man on the jetty was played by Mr. Price, who was, he's died now, David Price, but he was actually the man who owned the guest house where we stay. And Susanna and um, Leslie and Kit, Susanna and the Amazons, heard him rehearsing his one line in the garden and trying out which word of the one line that David had written to emphasize. <laughs> they thought this was hysterical, they were very naughty. And, pestered and teased him and in the end Claude shot the scene with a very low angle with the camera looking right up David Price's nose and if you watch the film um very carefully you can see that in an earlier shot or a later shot I forget which but I think it's an earlier shot he's got this little boy and he's pulling his trousers up and dragging him off down the beach in Bow Nest. He looks like a complete child molester. In fact, the child was his own son and he was wearing a costume that kept falling down. <laughs> Mr. Price was just trying to control this naughty little boy and sort out his costume. But it does look like a child molester. And then, of course, he um, wants to chat to a Roger on the um, jetty. And at some stage, I thought a sense of us have thought this was all a bit dodgy because cut out of the television version, but it's back in, in the remastered version, along with the rather terrifying shot of the Amazon's arrows that fly over our heads. And people watch this now. And Blimey, I didn't see that before on my VHS. And a lot of people ask me, they, God, I mean, that looks really dangerous. How did they do that? And... It was extraordinary. It was 50 years ago. And the prop men, it wasn't a visual effect. The prop men rigged up fishing line and they got the arrow and they made little loops of fishing line and they got a bow and they shot the arrows down the fishing line, which was rigged up to go right over our heads. And it looks fantastic. So I gave a talk once and was a fellow member of the Arthur Ransom Society, who's also an archer. I became an archer because of um, Swallows and Amazons. And we tried to rig this up in the cinema. It didn't work at all. <laughs> the bow got rather old and brittle. And the arrow went, and then it fell like this. Oof. <laughs> and we tried to shoot it down from the circle of the cinema onto the stage. It just got stuck halfway down. <laughs> so they did that brilliantly, but I actually used the technique of using fishing line as a sort of magical effect on film. I don't know if you've seen much people, they used to do it more, I think, um, in theatre and film. And I used it when I did um, my director's training course at the BBC. And um, we were given this ghost story and I used the fishing line to make these sheets of music fly around the studio and everyone thought it was marvellous. <laughs> um, and it was just this little trick I learnt from the prop men on Swallows and Amazons. Um, so there we are, learnt something. Hmm. Uh, and do you remember uh, Mike, Mike Pratt and David uh, Blagden at all? Yeah, well, David was asked to be the sailing director, um, but he was an actor. He'd been, he'd had a small part in Kidnapped, which was a film of, I suppose, um, maybe Stevenson's book. Um, and he was very good looking. We all fell instantly in love with him, but he wasn't a professional um, stage manager. And he hadn't broken down the script so we had two days to rehearse 
and he got the Amazon sailing Amazon and um, John and Susan sailing Swallow and just it hadn't occurred to him that actually I needed to learn how to sail Amazon because I catch her and I needed to row her and sail her to be at the helm so he didn't really think things through uh he did manage to sort of prop up Amazon when they careen her bottom when the Amazons clean her and things like that and he was super um, but I thought he did much better as Sammy the policeman. Uh, what was amusing was that, you know, this was 1973, the hairstyles for men were kind of helmet cuts with long hair. And um, Pete had flowing brown locks in those days. With beautiful hair. And none of the men wanted a short back and sides. In fact, they could hardly find any film extras under the age of 80 in the whole of the Lake District because people wanted to um, cling on to their hairdos. Um, apart from my father, who was happy to have his hair cut um, um, for free, uh, who appears as an extra about five different times in different locations. And um, David Blagden. And David Blagden had gorgeous flowing hair and he really didn't want to have a short back and sides, but he had to have it because he played the policeman. Um, so what he does in the scene is he takes off the policeman's helmet uh, to show, I suppose, his friends that he really did have a short back and sides. Um, the other chap who played Mr. Dixon was in the middle of shooting Black Beauty. And he used this as an excuse um, to avoid having short back and sides. And the poor hairdresser um, had to pin up his hair actually it's not great your attention is on his dialogue with John and the worms that he's giving him but under behind this cap you can see there are pin tucks when his um hair is pinned up and it does show it's not very good um so that was a bit of a blooper along with the odd thing like um, if you look very carefully, you can see an electric cable coming out of the top of our lantern where we're in, when we were in the tent because there was a little light bulb behind the candle to um, give us enough light inside the tent. So if you've got a very big screen, you can see the odd thing that um, didn't really be there, but um, you probably wouldn't have noticed any, I've pointed it out to you. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was wondering about the uh, the night sequences, Peter. Whether you, you, the approach to makeup in, in in night scenes and also sort of day, there's lots of day for night in in the film as well. You subtly change things a little bit for, for for those scenes. No, I don't. I mean, you don't have to do very much for the, because that's done with you know on the filming side with the technology that they have. You know, they know they know how it works and. You know the thing. As I said, the thing about makeup is it, you shouldn't ever see it as makeup. It should always be it, how the character is written in the script, and that's the trick that you learn with a lot of experience to how to achieve that. Because you know you said it earlier, and you know I, you know, we already discussed another film which was shot at a similar time where the makeup was more obvious. Because you know that's that was at the time of nineteen seventies. You know that's what you know that that was expected almost. And, but in, in fact, it doesn't work out for to, for the longevity of the film if it becomes a an you know a a memorable film that you want to look back on because you know you'll always be tied to that period. And so the whole thing with makeup is to make people look as normal as normal and correct. As possible, and um, but with lighting, it's to do with <laughs> your conversations you have with the lighting cameraman, and also with continuity, and also with any any other department that, that involves, you know, what what's going to appear on the screen, and you have to have that knowledge of what you need to do, and more importantly, what you don't need to do, because a lot of people jump to conclusions and say, oh, you have to use this because this is a different sequence and it's a, you know, it's a different, we're using different lighting. And 
if you discussed it with the lighting cameraman, um, then you you'll be aware of what you're seeing. And it, and as as I said to you on the previous conversation we've had, Philip, that um, in those days there weren't there were no monitors, you know, where you weren't you wouldn't be seeing things, you know, directly like you do nowadays, you know, next to the cam next to the camera. Um, you know what you were filming. You were, you know, the, the obviously the camera crew could see it, the director could look and see it, but not not continually like you do nowadays with, you know, with all the monitors on the set. So it was very interesting. But no, it's it's a, a lot of a lot of what you do with makeup is to do with the confidence that you are able to understand what's required. And as I said, it's really what's not required. I mean, you know, you don't need to do certain things to achieve a look. You just have to be confident that you've got the you've done the correct look in the first place. And you know, because I mean, Sophie mentioned it earlier. We had a tiny trailer, but the thing is, it doesn't matter what size of a trailer it is. You can have a, a, a two-seater trailer like we had, or you can have a fifth, a ten-seater trailer like nowadays. But what's different is the fact is that going back to what Sophie was talking about, is that we are the first people that you basically see as an actor on a daily basis, because you know you might see your driver if you're lucky enough to be driven to work. But if you're not being driven to work, you drive yourself to work. You arrive, on the, you arrive in the studio or in, on the set or on location, and you go straight into makeup. Um, and that's what it, that's, so, you then leave the actor then leaves that trailer in the right character look and and that's how they start their day so we are very important to level those people you know everything that's gone on they might have had a good a good night the night before they've had a bad sleep you know there's a million things that can they can arrive with which you deal with on those first few minutes of the filming day and then of course when it was on film you had a lot of time, not a lot of time, but enough time to do checks when they were reloading the cameras. Now, in the modern, you know, digital world, there is very little time to do checks because they can film continuously for a very long time now. Whereas mm -hmm. with the cameras that we were using then and, and for many, many years later, you know, there was only a limit to how many, a thousand foot film you, that, that was the limit to what you could film before you had to reload. And that gave us the time to do checks on makeup, which is always important. Mm -hmm. I mean, much more important, as I said earlier, on adults than it is on children. And, and, and Sophie, I was wondering about, because uh, there is a lot of day for night um, used, was that practicality or because as children, you couldn't work past a certain time? What was the, the reason for the, that for night, for night scenes? Uh, they didn't really explain it to us, but, um, you know, we were in the Lake District, so it's quite far north. We were filming around the longest day, so it wouldn't have got dark until about 10, 10.30 in mm -hmm. June. And uh, the the tricky bit is that, that that story is set a lot at night, but day for night had just come in. So the director of photography and the camera crew, um, crew were very excited about using day for night, but ideally they needed prime conditions so they needed blue skies with no clouds and bright sun to make it, it, it convincing um so it was very tricky especially out on the water and there's one scene where it's meant to be light and you've got this cloud bank and the lights reflecting off the cloud bank but otherwise they did pretty well but it just got more and more complicated because the rain would come in so in the end they used Mrs. Batty's barn on the farm at Background Farm uh, for a number of night scenes. And the designers made a camp there. We had a real fire, uh, which was magical for us and, and actually quite nice and easy for us. So when Titty's alone on Peel Island and she hears the owl call, that scene is actually shot in Mrs. Batty's barn and then later you see the Amazons there and Peggy's asleep and that's his in a rotten mood. But they also shot the night sailing scenes in that barn so they could get a low angle on um, John and Susan and Roger in Swallow 
And I think that those sailing scenes, we were well into the filming by the time we did that. And I think that Simon West is absolutely brilliant in them. I mean, I watching it for like the hundredth time. And I think he's sailing. And I know he wasn't sailing. Swallow is on a cradle in the barn. And there's a prop guy <laughs> wafting the wind. And that was done very, very well. And then they, I think they probably swapped the boat for Amazon, but maybe not. Maybe they just swapped the sail. And then I get in Amazon and you see me <sighs> trying to snuggle down in Amazon and get some kip. But then it cuts um, to me being woken by the burglars because Titty hears them land their rowing boat on Cormorant Island and lug out the trunk. And that was shot with day for night on Derwent Water. Quite difficult to do because I'm in the foreground waking up and trying to make out what's happening. And um, actually one of the prop guys and Gareth Tandy, the third assistant, played the burglars. Gareth said recently that he totally forgot that he was a burglar. Um, and it was the prop guys because it was a difficult thing to ask an actor to do, to row onto the island and then carry the trunk out of the boat. And I don't think they even thought about casting anyone. So they just slipped them into costume and um, members of the crew played those two burglars. In the BBC, um, adaptation of Swallows and Amazons made in 1962 when Susan George played Titty. Uh, they gave they gave the burglars much bigger part and parts and um, gave them a lot of humour. And actually the burglars' humour in that's a bit slapstick. Arthur Ratson absolutely loathed it. It probably was easier to shoot because you keep cutting to the burglars by themselves, plotting and planning and trying to decide what to, to steal. Um, and they wouldn't be able to do that at the end of the, shoot those scenes at the end of the day when the children had gone home and make more use of the filming time. But it kind of spoils the magic. And I learned when we made Coot Club and the Big Six that you could have adults in the scene, but actually, the scenes are more magical and special when it's just children or just a child by themselves with boats or owls or whatever. And in Coot Club, it was fine. Um, we had a lot of more, many more scenes where the children are interacting with adults, um, either as friends or enemies or parents or um, various structural roles like the solicitor and the housekeeper. But when you had a scene in the film with just two adults, so Dr. Dudgeon and PC Tedder, suddenly the, 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 bur the bubble is burst, the magic is lost, and it just grinds to a halt. Uh, I don't know if you, um, did, if you, made sure that there weren't any adult to adult scenes in Swallows and Amazons, David, or if that was a purposeful policy. It doesn't happen in the book, so, but I think that this adaptation of Swallows and Amazons works because the children are in every scene. You don't see any scenes without the children. Either Swallows and Amazons, you see Nancy and Peggy at home by themselves, but you don't see a scene just with two adults. And, that's one of the secrets of why it's worked. Yeah, I would, I, I would like to think that was right. But, but certainly, you see, the, the burglars, it's of no interest to us to get to know the burglars. Why do we have to get to know the burglars? It, the fact is the, they're ransacking the thing, and, and, and that's enough. Uh, the moment you give them characters and the moment you make them funny, uh, I think you're taking away completely from their function within the story. Well, I think you were brilliant there because there is that one scene where you just see the burglar's hands and they're quite violent and rough and they're shoving all his precious things out of the way and his mementos. And that's all the violence you need. You, It's fine. And it's good that you just see their hands. You don't see their faces. I really like that. Hmm. Uh, and did uh, one of one of Asia like going in the water in the end? I take it it was just one or two takes to, to do that. <laughs> was, was, he, was he a good sport? 
Yeah, he was pretty good about that. I don't know how challenging it was for you, Peter. I think we accepted that he was going to go in and that was it. It wasn't much time to drive off. No, but, you know, as I said, it, unless you need to do multiple takes, it's not too difficult. But, you know, you have to be given some time to get them to make them look normal again. But, uh, you know, that's that's one of the challenges of the job. And, and I think finally, one thing that, that strikes, I think, for me as a, for a modern audience member is how self-sufficient the, the, the children are, the skills that they've got that I don't think, well, certainly I never had and I don't know how many people would be at that at the ages described in the book to be able to sail to be able to gut fish to be you know, tie the knots etc do you do you think that's part of the appeal of a different sort of time and skill set and that sort of sort of um a simpler way, way of existing do you think that's part of the appeal of the film no definitely um when I was interviewed by Claude Watham he said what's your favorite program so I said Blue Peter and he said why and I said, because they show you how to do things. And that's exactly the answer he wanted. He wanted Swallows and Amazons, as was Ransom's intention, I think, to show children how to sail and put up a simple tent and light a fire and collect firewood and fill a kettle from with water and not get the scum in it and show them how to row, show by example. And I think that's exciting for children to think, oh, I could do that. Um, so it's all about dreams. And I think you did that brilliantly, David. It's, it's you capture the dream, but you allow children to dream. Um, it is a dream. And it takes adults back to how they would like their childhood to be. And I think that, I mean, goodness, the film sold houses in that, Adults that tell me, I go to literary festivals to speak and things, and they said that they want their children to have a Swallows and Amazons childhood. They want that. They want to, their children to be able to explore the countryside and meet the locals and learn to sail a boat and to have their own boat and do their own thing and learn how to be responsible for each other and, and themselves and to grow in that way. Um, Arthur Ransom admitted that actually his own childhood was more restrictive, although they went on holiday to Coniston Water themselves. His father was quite a disciplinarian and they didn't have as much freedom. I don't think they were allowed to go off to Peel Island by themselves. It was quite far, although he did go there as a child and did meet the Collingwood children, the Collingwood family who he um, uh, later um, met up with. He did meet them there. So he was capturing his own childhood and it keeps reverting back to either our dream, oh, I wish we'd lived like that, or we, we did live like that. We were allowed to run around in the woods by ourselves and perhaps you can't now. So it's opened up a lot of discussions about um, children being too restricted now because things aren't safe or perhaps now they've got mobile phones and they can be freer because there's... They can be tracked and we've got better safety equipment and uh, it's actually, it's becoming possible again to give children more freedom um, because we have the technology and we have the helmets <laughs> and life jackets. Uh, was that something that you wanted to bring across in the screenplay, David, that sort of that almost to sort of show people how to do it and um, the, the innocence of, of the time? Yes, although I would say that it was Claude who um, put the emphasis on that. And certainly I remember, well, um, he would come round and we would go through the script and he would be saying, well, let's put something in there where I want to see them doing that. I don't want to just hear about it, I want to see them doing it. And uh, uh, I think he takes a tremendous amount of the credit for that. Uh, and certainly when you watch the film and you see them actually doing these things, um, I think that's uh, that, that's a major feature and a major thing that people remember. Hmm. Um, when I started directing programmes at the BBC myself, one of the other, who was actually a producer, but he, he gave me some great advice. He said, when you're filming 
uh, ordinary people. He said it works really well if you give them something intricate to do or you ask them what they would be doing that's intricate, like cooking or um, making something work. But I think this is one reason why cookery programs are so good, because when you're in front of the camera, it's all a bit... You know what it's like when people just take your photograph? It's all a bit self-conscious making. So if you've got a task to focus on, like pulling up a sail or doing something, you come across on camera much better, much better. And certainly I took that tip on board. And so when I started directing myself, I was working with children mainly. I would give them things to do, just as Claude had given us things to do, and it worked really well. Um, and I started by making um, the physics program, so I kind of needed them to be fiddling around with batteries for the subject matter. But it's it, we are all fascinated, I think, by watching people do things. And when I was a child, I liked watching carpenters and craftsmen at work. It was fascinating to me. And I liked watching the mates on Blue Peter, as I told Claude. And it just works well in front of the camera. Well, I think it's probably a lovely place to end it, guys. Um, is, there, is there any final comments any of you would like to make about the film, its legacy or its effect on, on, on your lives? I mean, I'm just going to say that it was a wonderful experience. And, you know, and everybody on the film, well, me and the whole crew was, you know, it was a great experience for me. And um, I really appreciate, you know, I've learned a lot tonight, even more from both of Sophie and David about what what went on, you know, in the making, in the production as well, because obviously when you are a technician, you obviously are following the script. You're obviously, you know, very involved in what's going on. But, um, but you know, it's all teamwork. And in fact, <laughs> this now I, I, I've researched this. This was one of the smallest teamworks of any film I ever worked on because there were literally was two of us, you know, it was me and Ronnie. So um, that in itself is very unusual because every other film I've worked on there has been other people as well, which is because it's always, you always have a good team and that's what makes films work. But we had a very good team across the board on not just makeup and hair, but for every department on Swans and Amazons. And that's what made it unique. And, and as you've said earlier that it was real because we filmed everything for real. You know, it wasn't, we didn't fake any of the sailing. We didn't fake any of the, it wasn't done post-production or anything. It was done in the written, in the right spirit at the right time. And, and it achieved the results that are there forever. Uh, David? I think, I think all I would say really is, is that the fact that we're, talking about it now 50 51 years later uh and the fact that um there are various celebrations and the fact that people still remember it um is a great compliment to everybody who worked on it uh there must be many many films that were made around about the same time that would not be celebrated 50 years on um and uh, so there is a legacy there sophie has been very important in keeping that legacy going. But I think that uh, the, the, the wider thing is that Ransom uh, told a story which has been recognized as timeless, uh, which is quite an achievement. <laughs> and, uh, and hopefully the film represents that and, uh, and respects that. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted that I was able to be part of it. Um, for me, oddly, it was the bows and arrows that had an influence because um, the second feature film that I was in, I had to be an archery champion. And I'd started shooting because you can imagine we were all on location. It was actually my mother who was an archer who was teaching the Amazons to shoot with their bows and arrows. And we all wanted to go. Um, and mum taught me to shoot for the second film, but my my sisters, they don't shoot at all. So I kept up the archery, and in the end, I met my husband at an archery tournament. <laughs> so 
it really influenced my life from this <laughs> extraordinary angle of the green parrot's feathers. Um, but of course it did influence me in other ways. And I, I think the whole Arthur Ransom ethos of exploration, um, because of the film, really, I went into television production and uh, Claude, uh, I, I, he took me out to dinner before my major interview at the BBC. I became a general trainee, which was an extraordinary opportunity and worked in drama series and serials for five years. I worked in music and arts. I went, worked in BBC education. And then I I fell ill and to get better, I went to Africa and was just like Titty, um, found myself um, sitting under palm trees and forests full of parrots <laughs> and leading, I was on a horse rather than a boat particularly, but leading a real Swallows and Amazons life, cooking on fires for a lot of people actually, and um, putting up tents and taking down tents and exploring and drawing maps. And I earned my living in the African bush by drawing decorative maps in the exact style of us, <laughs> Stephen Spurrier in the um, frontispiece of the books. Uh, so it had ended up having a huge influence on my life. But if you'd asked me, I'd have said, oh, no, not at all. Not really. Not really. No, just something that happened when I was a little girl. But when I stopped and people challenged me and I thought about it, wrote about it, I thought, oh, blimey, it's influenced almost the whole of my life. <laughs> Hugely. Um, and I think people interested in that and they respect it um and i hear a lot of very touching stories people who tell me they watch the film every week they they need it to keep saying um and then at the um celebration we had at the cinema museum one doctor a chap in the audience stood up and he said um, i'm a doctor and when i was a young houseman i had to go into hospital on good friday and I walked through the children's wards. I said, every room, all the patients were snuggled up and quiet and peaceful. That is because in every single room, they were watching Swallows and Amazons on television. <laughs> and that was really touching. And you forget that this thing you've made is touching people at a vulnerable time in their lives. And maybe they're in hospital on Good Friday and Watching Swallows and Amazons brings them solace and peace and helps them to take a different perspective on life. So I hope we brought people a lot of joy and helped to centre them. And I just love it when I read the reviews. Um, do leave a review on the IMBD page for Peter's work or David's work because it's really special. And I love reading the reviews of when the film's been shown to inner city children who the critics thought wouldn't enjoy this kind of material at all. And they really love it. They love the pillow fight at the end on the boat. Now they really get into it. And I, I hope that it's drawn them to the books um, and helped extend people's lives and encourage people to get out there and learn to sail and join that canoeing club. and. Um, it certainly, I think, helped the people of Cumbria because I think it's done a lot uh, to encourage people to go there. So I hope it's boosted the tourist industry in Cumbria without <laughs> kind of decimating the whole place. I, I hope it's brought the right kind of people who really appreciate the lakes um, and respect the countryside. Hmm. Um, well, I just want to say thank you to, to all three of you, Peter, David, Sophie, for joining us and talking and, and sharing so, so many of your wonderful memories and experiences. It's been a, a very enjoyable evening together. Well, thank, thank you. you for um, logging on. I know that the people who've logged on from Australia, it's meant they've had to get up very early in the morning. So we're immensely, um, um, our hearts reach out to you there. And uh, we're very flattered that um, you've come to listen to us and to take part. Thank you, Philip, very much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you, Thank you Peter. And uh, take care, guys. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yeah. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. bye. bye.